Dear colleagues, welcome back after a lunch break. I see many relaxed faces, and I hope it was pleasant. The agenda for this afternoon includes two keynote speeches and two scrutiny sessions, so I hope you're all at your best. The first of these scrutiny sessions will focus on illegal weapons trafficking. But as an introduction to this session, we are welcoming Ms. Annelies Verlinde, Belgian Minister of the Interior, Institutional Reform, and democratic renewal, who will give a keynote speech. Ms. Verlinden, the floor is now yours for up to 15 minutes. Distinguished members of the Joint Parli Par Parliamentary Scrutiny Group on Europol, members of the national parliaments and members of the European Parliament, distinguished co-chairs, Ms. Grothede, Mr. Metsu and Mr. Lopez Aguilar, dear Ms. De Bolle, Katrien, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I am honored to address you this afternoon with a speech on the first scrutiny session on illegal weapons trafficking. The choice for this topic is not at random, as on 16 October last year, Belgium faced a terrorist attack in which the perpetrator used illegal weapons. This dreadful event showed once again the importance of stepping up our European and global cooperation in the fight against illegal weapons trafficking. On this joint parliamentary scrutiny group on Europol, I would like to say a few words on the important role Europol is playing in support of our police and law enforcement services. In an era marked by increasingly sophisticated and transnational criminal activities, the need for effective collaboration and coordination among law enforcement agencies has never been greater. And at the forefront of this effort stands Europol serving as a cornerstone of our European security. Europol, as the EU's law enforcement agency, plays a crucial role in facilitating police cooperation across member states. One of Europol's most important tasks is to remain to be the EU criminal information hub, bringing together ideally live criminal data and intelligence. Europol's ability to offer a platform bringing together this information and its abilities to perform operational and strategic analysis in support of the member states remains crucial. In this context, I'm very much looking forward to the report that Europol will publish at the end of March on the most threatening criminal networks active within the EU. This report will be an important deliverable for the Belgian presidency's priorities in fighting organized crime and drugs trafficking. Throughout the years, Europol has become increasingly capable of providing agile operational support to, to member states, assisting them in conducting complex investigations, in dismantling criminal networks, and in disrupting illicit activities. The concept of operational task forces has evolved into a flexible and operationally driven tool through which successful operational outcomes have emerged. For instance, I'm very grateful for the important support Europol has provided in the Sky ECC investigation, without which we would not have reached the impressive number of arrests and successful outcomes in numerous court cases. As Europol is dealing with vast amounts of personal and sensitive data, it is crucial that Europol upholds the highest standards of data protection with respect of privacy. I'm convinced that Europol has a good track record and remains committed to ensuring that data is handled in respect of the applicable legal framework. And a good and constructive cooperation with the European Data Protection Service remains key to ensure that Europol can keep supporting all law enforcement services. But Europol's impact extends beyond operational support. The agency also plays a vital role in research and innovation, 
helping to develop cutting-edge tools and techniques to address evolving threats. In a short time, Europol's Innovation Lab has already evolved into an indispensable partner in fostering innovation and driving progress in this field, together with our law enforcement agencies. I would like to emphasize that the importance of Europol for police collaboration within the EU cannot be overstated. From facilitating information sharing to providing operational support and driving innovation, Europol plays a central role in safeguarding the security and well-being of European citizens. Dear Katrin, please be ensured of my support to the agency and the commitment of our Belgian police services to keep working together with Europol. Now, dear colleagues, to come back to the topic at hand, I stand before you to address a matter of utmost importance, the threats posed by illegal weapons trafficking. Firearms trafficking remains an important threat to our society. Recent events underscore the escalating trends presenting an ever-growing menace to our society, with new important challenges for law enforcement services. The use of firearms magnif magnifies the scales of harm inflicted, whether by radicalized individuals, mentally disturbed actors, or orchestrated terrorist assaults. Furthermore, firearms are increasingly utilized by organized crime, enabling them to enforce their criminal enterprises, retaliate against rivals, or settle disputes with competing factions. We can also attest to such a trend in Belgium. The worst happened in early 2023, with the death of an 11-year-old girl in a drug-related shooting. Illegal weapons trafficking represents a multifaceted challenge that demands our unwavering attention and concerted action. Weapons traffickers are exploiting regulatory loopholes and weaknesses in law enforcement to traffic firearms and other deadly weapons. One of the challenges we face is the scale and scope of illegal weapons trafficking within the EU. For further information on the threat level and the difficulties in having a good intelligence picture, I refer to the presentation of Europol that will follow. But let me give you one statistic that paints a stark picture. An estimated 35 million illicit firearms are in circulation among civilians in the EU, with approximately 630,000 firearms reported stolen or lost in the Schengen Information System. This demands enhanced cooperation between national law enforcement agencies, as well as greater cooperation with, with Europol and the other EU institutions to disrupt the flow of illicit weapons and to dismantle the criminal networks behind them. Additional challenges are now becoming increasingly apparent. The increasing use of advanced technologies has presented new challenges for law enforcement in combating illegal weapons trafficking. From 3D printed firearms to modified weapons and counterfeit arms, criminals are leveraging technology to evade detection and to circumvent regulatory controls. This necessitates ongoing investment in additional databases, training, technology, and forensic capabilities to stay ahead of emerging threats and to adapt to changing tactics. As a testimony to this trend, I want to refer again to the terrorist attack against Swedish football supporters in Brussels in October last year. The Belgian police has tried to trace the weapons that were used. In this attack, the perpetrator used three weapons. The investigation showed that the automatic firearm that was used was in fact an illegally crafted weapon with a falsified registration number. The other two guns were modified Turkish alarm guns that had been converted to a functioning firearm. Last week, our federal judicial police force was able to dismantle an illegal weapons workshop where ready-to-use weapons were made with a 3D printer in combination with parts from online shops. The 3D weapons weapons were traded in chat groups on the dark web. 
and the investigation revealed that several packages containing weapon parts were sent to residents in Oud Heverle near Leuven in Flanders. In the residence, investigators found an illegal weapons workshop and during the police raids, the 3D printer was actively producing pen guns. Dozens of metal and plastic weapon parts, as well as ready-to-use 3D firearms, were seized. Searches and arrests were also conducted in France. According to the public prosecutor, this represents one of the biggest police successes in the fight against 3D arms trafficking in Europe. Informed by the French authorities in August of last year, the Leuven Federal Police, Judicial Police, initiated this investigation based on that information. And these two examples show the recent trend that high-profile criminal offences and terrorist attacks are being committed with so-called ghost weapons. These weapons are not homologated and not traceable. This, make them, this makes them increasingly popular with criminals, as you cannot detect where the weapons come from. Obviously, the fact that these weapons are untraceable creates an important gap in our strategic, operational and tactical analysis capability on the criminal use and trafficking of firearms. It is an important problem for which our current firearms registries and databases are not fit. These emerging threats such as modified weapons, 3D printed firearms and counterfeit assault rifles evade traditional registration systems, necessitating a tailored approach to data collection and analysis. This gap can only be solved by creating an EU integrated database that captures all or as many seized firearms as possible. Addressing this data gap requires standardized reporting mechanisms, improved information sharing protocols, and greater cooperation between national authorities and Europol. Hence the reason why we, as the Belgian Presidency of the EU Council, are firmly convinced that there is an urgent need to create such a database on seized firearms. During the informal meeting of COSI, we received wide support of this idea. Let me conclude by emphasizing that the fight against illegal weapons trafficking is one of the greatest challenges facing law enforcement agencies in the European Union today. It requires a comprehensive and coordinated approach grounded in collaboration and innovation. The cross-border nature of firearms trafficking demands a unified approach with databases harmonized across member states to facilitate information sharing and operational coordination. Collaboration between national enforcement agencies and especially Europol is essential to combat this effectively. Possibly we should also reflect on further strengthening our regulatory frameworks. Ladies and gentlemen, I now leave you in the capable hands of our colleagues of the European Commission, Europol and the Flemish Peace Institute for the remainder of this first scrutiny session. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Ms. Verlinden, for your keynote speech. Undoubtedly, collaboration between member states and Europol is essential for European security, as you mentioned. Dear colleagues, we will now move to our first scrutiny session, which will focus on illegal weapons trafficking. And I pass the floor to my co-chair, Mr. Metsu, who will introduce the next speakers. Thank you, Ms. Verlinden. Thank you, Mr. Engerer. Uh, for this first scrutiny session on illegal weapons trafficking, we are joined by uh, Mr. Olivier Onidi, who is uh, Deputy Director General at the Directorate General for Migration and Home Affairs of the European Commission. We have Mr. Jean-Philippe Lecouf, Deputy Exec Executive Director of Europol, and Mr. Niels Duquet. You will all have 10 minutes each for your presentation. Before we open the floors, we go for a one minute question and a one minute answer. Just press your button once. Mr. Onidi, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair, for, for this uh, invitation. 
Uh, I, would, I would like to uh, maybe use four uh, aspects of uh, our uh, public policy uh, uh, developments uh, in uh, uh, the field of uh, firearms to illustrate the contribution and the importance, actually, of uh, uh, Europol. The first one uh, being the fact that uh, we have, uh, notably following the uh, terrorist attack in 2015, built quite a uh, uh, strong regulatory framework uh, uh, aiming at curbing the use of uh, uh, firearms. Uh, uh, and uh, this is regularly uh, uh, updated thanks to uh, information that uh, is uh, being provided to us by Europol. For example, we have adapted uh, recently the legislation in order to capture convertible alarm and signal weapons, and we've just heard from the minister how relevant uh, this uh, uh, has actually been. Um, also uh, the modified the scope of the legislation in order to capture the reactivation of deactivated weapons, which is being also done on a regular basis. And finally, uh, we've also uh, updated the legislation on the 3D printing uh, uh, weapons, uh, since this has become a real phenomenon uh, in order to produce new uh, uh, firearms. It is also based on uh, uh, facts and uh, uh, active uh, uh, work of Europol in this field that we have recently put uh, forward a legislation trying to capture also and to organize a regime uh, on import and export of firearms, since we have also the evidence there that too many of those firearms actually come from outside of the uh, European Union. Second very important contribution from Europol is uh, uh, the actual intelligence uh, we receive. And I think the minister here as well highlighted uh, uh, the importance of having a Europe-wide consolidated, aggregated uh, uh, database that uh, captures all the seizures of uh, firearms. Why? Because we need to register uh, these firearms. Why? Because we need to trace also these firearms in order to allow all the police forces to do this. We actually need a uh, set of information that really registers all the different uh, uh, firearms. And uh, uh, in addition to this, we're very happy to have Mr. Duquet here uh, today since we also nurturing uh, uh, these uh, uh, information systems with additional uh, uh, information, notably what will be presented to us later on, on the referencing of all incidents uh, uh, using firearms. This as well, in order to constantly learn from new modus operandi and uh, uh, be able to either update uh, the uh, legislative framework or also be uh, more effective in terms of the operational uh, uh, activities. Third aspect linked with Europol is, of course, its uh, core business, I would say, which is the operational support to member states' investigation. Here as well, we see in the overall coordination uh, uh, of uh, uh, all activities against uh, organized crime, how important uh, uh, it is to have one agency that actually captures and provides uh, the infrastructure and the platforms for the different police forces to actually work together, and more and more information that also uh, benefits the judiciary in terms of moving up uh, uh, the scale of investigations towards uh, the prosecution. Final very important contribution, the extensive network of agreement that Europol is developing with a number of third countries and uh, uh, the support Europol provides us in order to uh, develop partnership with uh, countries around us in order to be better informed uh, through the information that those third countries uh, have, but also help those uh, third countries, notably those immediately around us, uh, two uh, examples, the Western Balkans and Ukraine, uh, which we want uh, uh, to have similar uh, degrees of defense than we have uh, achieved in the European Union in terms of the legislation, in terms also of uh, the capacity to uh, register and the capacity to investigate uh, and uh, uh, identify criminal uh, uh, groups uh, smuggling uh, firearms. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Mr. Onidi. Mr. Monsieur Lecouf, you are up next. The floor is yours for up to 10 minutes as well. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, dear delegates, uh, it's my pleasure to uh, give you a brief overview of the uh, security picture related to uh, trafficking of uh, weapons and explosives in the EU uh, to uh, feed our debate. Um, first, uh, what is the status of the threat? Uh, well, firearms trafficking remains a key threat in the EU serious and organized crime landscape and terrorist landscape. It was underlined by the minister. In addition to uh, being the main criminal activity for some networks, it is nearly always a complement to other criminal activities. Weapons and explosives trafficking enables a broad range of other serious and organized crime activities. For instance, this includes the use of firearms by those involved in drug trafficking, but also extortion, racketing, and all sorts of criminal activities. Criminals also involved in ATM attacks or terrorist attacks also use explosives uh, to support their activities, in some cases obtaining them from dedicated criminal networks. So the availability of illicit firearms and Pyrotechnics, I think it's important to underline this also, uh, reinforce serious and organized crime-related violence. Weapons and explosives enable criminal networks to engage in extreme acts of violence. And there's a clear relation with this availability of these weapons and the raise and the increase of violence by criminal network. One of the main questions for law enforcement uh, that we need to answer is where illegal firearms are coming from. We know that most illegal firearms in circulation in the EU continue to originate from the EU. They can be diverted from legal supply, they can be reactivated or converted from non-lethal firearms, or they can be manufactured in clandestine workshops. We had a case in December 2023 in relation with Spain, Canada, Germany, Ireland, and Netherlands when we found 10 workshops where these firearms were in fact manufactured illegally. Additionally, firearms available on EU black markets still heavily originate from weapon stocks created during past conflict in the region close to the EU, for example, the Western Balkans. But the range of trafficking weapons, firearms, and explosives has grown over the past years. For instance, we see an increase and a new threat coming from 3D printed weapons. It was underlined by the minister, and I will in present you the, this case more in detail. We see more investigation focusing on in this issue. Additionally, illicit uh, privately manufactured web, uh, firearms appears to have become more common. They are assembled from parts that are sourced legally and then combined with illegally purchased firearm parts. We know these weapons have been used in violent incidents in the EU recently. Finally, it appears that the illicit trade of in heavy pyrotechnics has also intensified in the past years. For instance, they are sourced by criminal networks to commit crimes such as ATM attacks or drugs-related violence. A couple of uh, examples that I uh, can illustrate, it was a... Uh, uh, the work of the member states and the support that we are provided, Europol. First, in relation to the war in Ukraine. Since the beginning of the conflict, we analyzed that there could be an increased threat of seeing weapons being illegally transported across the border into the EU. The availability of large stockpiles of weapons during 
and at the end of the conflict may also attract criminals. Until now, it has not materialized to the extent initially expected, but Europol is monitoring the situation closely. We are also working very closely with our Ukrainian authorities, our Ukrainian colleagues, to address these potential threats. We have guest officers that are deployed in Ukraine's neighboring countries. We are facilitating information exchange with Ukraine. We conduct regular threat assessment on the involving situation. And we have an important agreement with Ukraine to share information and intelligence on lost and stolen weapons, as well as on seized firearms and drones, so they can be cross-checked and further analyzed. Ukraine shared the information over 440,000 lost and stolen weapons and over 10,000 seized weapons with Europol, with the last update received from our Ukrainian colleagues in December 2023, quite recently. I want also to share the detail of the recent operational case that the minister was underlying. So it starts in 2023 in France, where France launched an investigation on the production and selling of 3D printed guns, so-called FGC9, and gun PCs via the platform Telegram. See, keep in mind, via Telegram. The investigation revealed that the person behind this weapon was based in Belgium, which launched the joint investigation between France and Belgium, supported by Europol. The investigation revealed that the firearms were sent via parcel and buyers were identified in France. A joint operation was carried out in January 2024, so very recently, in both countries, which led to 12 arrests, the dismantlement of the 3D printed workshop, and the weapons were seized. Some of the buyers arrested were linked to other criminal activities, such as uh, drug dealing or right-wing extremism. Europol supported the investigation by conducting operational analysis, coordinating the, op the cooperation between the two member states and deploying experts during the action day. This investigation continues to uh, identify other potential buyers. But despite the effort of law enforcement, key challenges remain. First of all, it is important to note that we are faced with a fragmented intelligence on weapon seizure in the EU. It was underlined again by the, the, the Belgian minister. Uh, tracing illicit firearms used in organized crime activities remain challenging. This is uh, in part due to the fact that the firearms used to carry out serious and fatal violence are often unregistered or diverted or stolen and are their identification marking altered or removed. An additional challenge is linked to the fact that firearms and firearms components are trafficked through parcel services. This makes them hard to detect. The detection is challenged by the lack of sale registers of alarm and signal weapons that can be tran transformed and converted in real weapons. Some legal discrepancy further caused the diversion of firearms to the illegal market. And finally, the non-compliance of some EU member states with the EU directive on firearms and the large production of blank firing pistols create a major challenge when looking to counter this threat. Europol continues to do its utmost to support member states in countering this threat and facing these challenges. We have dedicated uh, analysis projects specialized in weapons and explosives, 
You can see on the slide the support that we have provided in 2023 with this analysis project. Our resources are available on, to our stakeholders from expertise, information, analysis, coordination, to financial and logistical support in international law enforcement operation. Weapons trafficking is also an impact priority. <laughs> Additionally, as it was said, Europol is working together with stakeholders on setting up, setting up the Europol's Firearms Intelligence Hub and Ballistic Hub that will facilitate the exchange of ballistic and weapon identification information between EU member states. This including ghost weapons, 3D weapons, and so on. It's a long-term project, but it's a project that we need to carry uh, and to, to take to the end. Mm -hmm. I want to conclude by saying that uh, we have come a long way in countering this threat posed by the trafficking of weapons and explosives, and we will continue to work hard to counter this threat because, as I told you, we have improvements that are possible. Thank you for your attention, and I'm ready to answer the, your question. Thank you. Thank you, Monsieur Le Gouff. In this scrutiny session, we have a third speaker, uh, Mr. Duque. So the floor is yours also for 10 minutes, and afterwards we will uh, conduct the questions. Thank you, Mr. Metsu. Uh, thank you for the organization for inviting me to talk today about firearms trafficking and gun violence. Um, let me quickly introduce myself. I'm the director of the Flemish Peace Institute, which is a research institute affiliated to the Flemish Parliament in Belgium. Um, and as our institute has been doing research on firearms trafficking for more than 10 years now, looking into various aspects of the trafficking itself, but also the impact the trafficking has, for example, on gun violence and the broader society. So what I will try to do here today is give you just a, a, a quick overview of five elements that I think are very important to stress, which are the characteristics of illicit gun markets today, um, the, the approach to tackle firearms trafficking, the impact of firearms trafficking, and then uh, let, have some attention for the new threats that are coming uh, and demonstrate how research or the research community can also contribute to this law enforcement uh, activity. Um, as uh, Flemish Peace Institute has been coordinating uh, several EU-funded research projects, uh, we have a, a large experience working together with the law enforcement community, and we really try to bring together the, the research community with the law enforcement community and bring the results of that cooperation to the policymakers. So that's why I'm very happy that I'm here today. Um, I also want to thank the European Commission and Europol for all the support we have been receiving for the last many years. So, just so you know, as part of our most recent project, Project Insight, which was funded by the European Commission, uh, we just published eight reports specifically on various aspects of firearms trafficking. Everything that we produce is available online. So I encourage you all to go to the websites and read the reports. Um, this is uh, to start with. This is a simplified version of the illicit firearms market in Belgium. Simplified. Uh, it's a very complex problem. Uh, many different issues that play a role. Uh, and what is important, this is, may hold true for Belgium, but this is not necessarily the case for other European countries. Um, we can basically state that there is not a single EU illicit gun market. There are many markets across the EU, and there are a lot of differences in the various types of modes of operandi of the traffickers, the types of guns that are available, and so on. Uh, and this can be clearly illustrated, for example, by looking at the prices of, of firearms. Um, there are, however, also a couple of similarities, uh, and one of them is that uh, criminal demand is driving illicit firearms trafficking, and especially, it was mentioned earlier today as well, drug criminal demand. Mm -hmm. uh, they are the prime customers of illicit gun markets. Um, what else is a similarity? Um, in most uh, countries, we actually see uh, handguns as being the primary tool of violence when you look at firearms. Even in countries that are known to have a lot of assault rifles, for example, they are still a minority of the seizures that we uh, see. And then finally, uh, for a long time, illicit gun markets were closed markets. Uh, you needed certain criminal connections in order to acquire certain weapons. Uh, we see that in some European countries, this closed character of the market is eroding, and it's becoming easier for criminals and younger criminals to uh, get access to firearms. And this has a lot of consequences that I will try to explain in a second. Um, let me first 
start with looking at the, the, the approach that we need to have to tackle firearms trafficking. Uh, very often, uh, the, the fight against firearms trafficking is driven by incidents. It is a big shooting, a lot of repercussions. That's when we have a lot of attention for this problem. But what we, of course, need is a very comprehensive and a structural approach. Comprehensive because of all the complexities of trafficking and structural because criminals adapt. They keep changing their modus operandi, trying to be able to provide firearms to various types of criminals. Um, so what do we need? We need to work on policy, we need to work on the operational capacities, and we need to work on intelligence. I'm not gonna reiterate everything that was just said by Mr. Onini, but there have been some clear steps taken to uh, strengthen the regulation in the EU with the revision of the Firearms Directive in 2017 and other specific technical procedures. There are various steps that have been taken at the operational side, um, with national firearm focal points being promoted with the work of Europol, uh, the upcoming firearms hub which is coming, uh, international cooperation within the EU but also with the neighborhood countries is improving, uh, Impact Firearms is playing an important role, so we see a lot of activities there as well. Uh, what we do see is that in many member states, investigating firearms trafficking is not a priority. Um, and very often this also means that weapons are not being traced, uh, seizure data is not always very reliable or very comprehensive. Uh, and I also hear that there's positive notes coming from COSI working on a consolidated uh, database on seizures, which would definitely be a good step, but we're not there yet. We still have a lot of, uh, uh, like, as we said, in a fragmented intelligence picture as we speak. Um, and this is, of course, I think, where the research community can play a role. Uh, this is where we can try to see if we can help with the strategic analysis. Uh, so that's why we start looking at the data that is available. Now, this is a, a, a figure from a report from a few years ago. You probably cannot read everything that's said, but what is important to know is the orange line is the number of gun deaths in a specific country around 2000, and the blue line is the most recent we had at that time. So most of the data was for 2015 up to 2019. And you can see that in almost all countries, we, saw, we see a very strong decrease in gun deaths in the EU. There's just a few exceptions, um, Cyprus and Malta, but they're very small countries with very few incidents, so there's a lot of fluctuation. But the third country there is Sweden, where you actually see that the number of gun deaths has doubled between 2000 and 2019. Uh, what is also uh, a bit disencouraging is that we also noticed when we're looking at the most recent figures that this decrease, this downward trend, seems to have halted in many European countries, and in some countries it's moving up again. Uh, so it seems like we're at, at, at the turning point. Um, so what do we know about firearms trafficking? Um, we know that the good news is that it, it, there's a long-term downward trend, but on the other hand, we see reports like this one, Sweden with very high levels of gun violence, we see drug cr criminal violence uh, in, a, in, in upcoming uh, trends in, in Spain in certain areas. We see Marseille. We see the uh, upcoming of uh, 3D printed firearms. Uh, many of those things, this is just uh, an article from a few days ago here in Brussels, many shootings that just occurred. Um, so this is you know, something that we need to work on. Uh, why do we need to work on this? Uh, because firearm trafficking has a very important impact. As I mentioned earlier, in some European countries, we see that this access to firearms has uh, become easier for younger criminals. And younger criminals tend to be more impulsive than high-ranked criminals. They tend to shoot their guns much more often, which increases feeling of uncer uncertainty in the criminal world, which leads to a higher demand for firearms, which leads to more trafficking, and then leads to more shooting. So this is a vicious circle that we're experiencing in some countries. I think Sweden is a very clear example of that, but we also see the same tendencies uh, to a certain extent in Belgium, in the Netherlands, in Spain, uh, south of France, and so on. So this is something we absolutely want to avoid. Um, second important impact, of course, is on the, on the local community. Uh, and there's a very direct impact. Um, it was mentioned uh, by the minister as well. Sometimes we see uh, mistakes. We see young kids getting shot um, we also see that it also has another strong impact uh, where you see, for example, that in the Netherlands, a lawyer was shot in the streets of Amsterdam because he was working on a trial case for a drug criminal. Uh, a journalist wor working on the same case was also shot a couple of years later. Even here in Belgium, the Minister of Justice had to go to a safe house twice because there were uh, clear suspicions of people trying to kidnap him or his family with firearms. So there is a very clear 
uh, impact on the local community and actually on the, the member states. In addition to that, we also see an indirect impact. Uh, we see, uh, of course, the social cost of gun violence. We see that people have feelings of insecurity. We see uh, that this could lower their trust, the public trust in police, in justice, and so on. And then finally, there's also a clear connection between firearms trafficking and terrorism, um, where we see that because it's becoming easier for younger criminals, lower level criminals to get access to firearms, it's also becoming easier for terrorists with, who have those connections. Uh, we saw this in France, we saw this in Brussels, uh, and we also see this in other places in Europe. The, the, the picture on the bottom left is actually a shooting in, in, in uh, Halle in 2019 in Germany, where the perpetrator actually used uh, a few couple of guns, but also a gun that included some 3D printed firearms. And he was actually calling all other uh, terrorists to do the same. Which brings me to the new threats. Uh, I'm only gonna highlight two of them. First one, 3D printing. We have been talking about this one. This is a picture of the Liberator. This was the very first 3D printed firearm in the world from 2013, uh, almost completely made out of plastic. Um, I wouldn't fire that, that because it, it, it's dangerous for your hands, uh, but technology hasn't stopped. Uh, in just a few years time, we're now looking at the FGC9, which stands for Fuck Gun Control 9 Millimeter. Why am I saying this? Because this was a, a deliberate m ideological motivation to produce such a, a gun, because you can actually make it uh, based on the firearm components which are freely available in Europe, and the other ones you can 3D print. Um, the quality of these guns are, is much higher. So this is something to keep in mind, because it will allow people without criminal connections to also access firearms. Um, just a, a quick videotape from, I think, about two and a half years ago in the Netherlands. Uh, uh, they dismantled the 3D printing workshops, just like we did in, in Belgium a couple of weeks ago. Uh, in the Netherlands, nine 3D printers were actually working at the time the police intervened, uh, which clearly shows that there is also a lucrative objective there uh, if they are investing in so many printers. And then finally, uh, we mentioned as well uh, previously, Ukraine. This is a picture from before the Russian invasion. Um, this was right after the Russian invasion where we know that tens of thousands of firearms have been handed out to normal citizens. Uh, there's two of them here protecting a bridge. And we have heard uh, the, the worries from many law enforcement agencies in Europe and abroad that there might be a risk of the weapons ending up in other hands after the conflict. Um, what does that mean? Uh, there are various modes of trafficking of firearms, there's increased availability of firearms, an escalation of criminal gun violence, and a very strong societal impact of firearms, including terrorist access. The EU has taken several steps, and Europol plays a very important role, but it's important that the member states also use Europol to its full extent, uh, because it's of course not always the case. Uh, and then firearms trafficking has transformed in recent years, but it also keeps transforming. That's why it's very important to improve our intelligence picture. Now, if I can just have two more minutes, I would like to show what the research community can do, uh, which is also what Mr. Onini mentioned. There's a recent project that we just did, which is Project Insight, in which we developed uh, an AI-driven monitor of incidents with firearms across the EU. And we did this in order to align ourselves with the EU Action Plan on Firearms Trafficking that mentioned the development of such a tool together with Europol. And we did this together with Europol. Um, and it was funded by the European Commission. Uh, and it's a centralized knowledge hub. Um, so I'm gonna show you what that means. If you go to the website, gunviolence.eu, you will find a lot of information on every member state, but also the monitor itself, which I will try to show in a second. Normally now you should see the monitor that we developed. It's completely based on open source. Um, so everything that we use is open source. And uh, instead of doing this manually, we use artificial intelligence to constantly scrape through more than 350 media sources across the EU, all EU member states, 24 languages, quite a challenge. Um, and we use different types of algorithms to detect uh, firearm incidents, to cluster them together uh, when there are several articles about one specific uh, incident, and then of course to codify them as well so we can look for that. So we had a lot of attention this weekend for the shootings in Brussels, um, but this is uh, actually the, the situation it was this weekend uh, across Europe. We have about 40 incidents, not just in Brussels, and we can zoom in wherever we want. So we can just go and zoom, for example, to Berlin, uh, and in Berlin, it's actually geolocated, so if we know the exact address, it will actually go to the address, 
and you can see here, for example, you can click on it, and you actually see all the information you need. So it's the articles that we base it on uh, in German, but there's always an English uh, short summary. We know that the perpetrator was a 25-year-old male. He shot a 35-year-old male. There was a dispute. Shots were fired. A submachine gun, machine pistolen, was used, and also something non-lethal, pepper spray. So this is what we can do. Uh, this is just one example of looking at uh, Berlin. But as I said, there were about 40 of them in Europe. So we can also go take a look, for example, uh, somewhere else. And let's say we go to all of Europe. Oops, not East Austria. And we show it. We can actually go more towards Eastern or Central Europe. We can go, for example, to Zagreb. And there, for example, you see uh, that it was not a shooting, but it was actually a seizure from a man, a 48-year-old man who had an illegal arsenal, including various types of firearms. And if we go to the right, we can actually see which types of firearms were there. Um, so it's a pistol, a rifle, and so on and so on. So this is what the technology can do um, if you use it correctly. And it also allows us to do analysis. Uh, for example, if I would now look for the EU, and this is the final thing that I'm going to show, and look for every incident since the beginning of... Uh, this year, and we look specifically for drugs, for example, we can actually see that as well. These are all the incidents. Again, we can zoom in as much as we want to, and we can actually get the analytics as well, showing that 92% you know, of perpetrators are male, and so on, and so on. So this is a huge tool that we have developed um, over the years with the help of our law enforcement communities, not to replace government data, but to complement it and to encourage governments to collect even better data so we can get a much better intelligence picture. So with that, I would like to end my presentation. Of course, I'm available for all types of questions. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Duque. And Mr. Enger will now chair the debate. Thank you, Mr. Matsu. So let's now move to our discussion. Um, as we have already gone through this, uh, there will be alternately two members of national parliaments and then one member of the European Parliament until the list is exhausted. So far we have three requests. Uh, if you want to put in your request, just press the button and the microphone in front of you will have a green bulb. I remind you that this is a shorter session, therefore please try to be as concise as possible so that we have enough time to, for all our speakers. And we kindly ask delegates to limit their questions to one minute and to specify whom they would like to address their question. And I also invite Mr. Onidi, Mr. Lekouf, and Mr. Deku to please try and answer in one minute. I also remind you, something that I don't do, uh, to speak clearly and slowly for our interpreters. I have that problem as well, because I tend to speak fast. So let's move on to the first speaker we have, who has requested the floor. So firstly, from the Cypriot Parliament, uh, Elias Miriantus. You have the floor for one minute. Dear colleagues, uh, our priority should be to target criminal networks and individual criminal involved in the illicit trafficking, the distribution and use of uh, firearms. In this context, Europol plays an important role in supporting member states find criminal networks involved in illegal weapons and explosive trafficking, working closely with expert specialists in order to counter terrorism on international investigations. At the same time, we believe that Europol specialists and analysts should, be, should uh, strengthen, reinforce their efforts to assist member states in developing their own resources to monitor and, and tackle their darkness phenomenon. In this prospect, we should find new methodologies for investigation, investigating firearms-related crime with specific focus on the intelligence-led policies. Against the possible rise of firearms trafficking because of the ongoing war in Ukraine, this is an urgent need for a unified legal approach, especially low regulating firearms trafficking, replacing the existing fragment by law, creating thus a more robust and effective legal framework. Lastly, a unified legal framework is the leech pit in our collective 
efforts to counter firearms trafficking and enhance cooperation among the law enforcement agency play pivotal role in curbing in this pervasive. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would like to remind our delegates to take note of the time. Uh, we need to have one minute interventions. Um, from the panel, who would like to reply? There wasn't anyone particular. Yes. I mean, there, there, there were many, many different dimensions in this uh, in this question, uh, all very relevant. I would I would take maybe three. First, Ukraine. Uh, I think uh, we uh, we were fortunate enough to uh, uh, learn a lot from what happened with the Western Balkan, and uh, from that point onwards, we were, I believe, quite fast uh, in Europe to immediately, once uh, uh, the war started, uh, uh, to actually engage with the Ukrainian authorities and made sure mm -hmm. that. On their side, despite, of course, the very, very difficult situation, uh, we got uh, a number of uh, very important safeguards, starting, of course, with the capacity to register all firearms and the capacity to immediately share information on incidents, uh, uh, something that allowed us uh, to be better prepared and act. At the same time, because of the threat uh, also concentrating around border uh, areas, we also were able to deploy specific uh, assistance uh, uh, to border guards in order also at border crossing points to be exceptionally mindful of the possibility of those type of traffics. Second aspect, the legal framework, I believe, is quite uh, unified in the EU. We, we actually have quite a robust uh, uh, legal framework. What is still an un unachieved uh, uh, business is the actual legal framework on the import and export of firearms. This is something that we are, with difficulty, I must say, negotiating, uh, Parliament, uh, European Parliament, and uh, uh, the Council uh, of uh, Member States, uh, which will reinforce our capacity also to have like a big risk on this. Third, organized crime, and I think uh, 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 Mr. Lecouf will, uh, will follow on that. Uh, we've seen elements of uh, uh, firearms in so many cases involving uh, uh, organized crime, which led us actually to have a different approach towards organized crime, trying to hit really the criminal organizations themselves and not uh, uh, act on uh, some of the features of the crime in a separate manner. Oh, Philippe. Short, yeah, just, just very short, but uh, yes, to say that uh, <clears throat> we try to uh, focus really on the the key um, with the, through the high value target and uh, operational task forces concept to uh, attack the key players. And for sure, the drug traffickers or those who are selling uh, weapons uh, to the criminals are part of our high value targets in uh, all. Um, Organization. So I don't want to be too long because, uh, but uh, I will come back uh, on this later, I think. Thank you. We now move on to our Finnish colleague, Mira Nieminen. One minute. Thank you, Mr. Chair and dear colleagues. Illegal weapons are associated with a high risk in increasing violence and crime. Therefore, it's it is important to do everything possible to prevent the spread. In Finland, the issues of uh, 3D weapons, weapons has recently been on the agenda. Most visible cases have been re related to ex extremism and terrorism, but 3D printed weapons have been noticed among traditional criminals as well. The cost uh, on 3D printers and materials have uh, decreased and necessary. Blueprints to produce the weapons are available from open sources and in the, on the internet. It is imp uh, impossible that, um, it's possible that uh, 3D printing will be a new source or acquire weaponry, or at least it could become an attractive alternative to traditional firearms, although production requires some expert, expertise and is relatively time-consuming. 
So my question is, uh, what opportunities do we have uh, together to monitor the manufacture of requirements and substances like printer or plastic, what it used for making these 3D weapons? And how could we identify these criminals better? Thank you. Yeah, maybe if I, if I can. Um, on, on this, uh, you are f uh, fully right that uh, there are online some, uh, let's say, manual how to manufacture these 3D weapons. We have had in Europol what we call a, a terrorist identification task force. That is to say, we gather experts from different countries and we try to identify on the website, whether it is open web or dark web, where these manuals are. And uh, we try to refer, well, we refer this content to the, to the online service provider, asking them to remove this content from online. But as you know, it's very difficult to uh, check and to control. But it's something that we are doing, trying also to see if we can uh, start investigation, ask the member states to start investigation in order to uh, go and to find those who are putting these uh, manuals on, online. So it is what we are doing because we are fully aware that this is through these manuals that people can with a, a simple 3D uh, uh, um, a printer, they can uh, build and manufacture these uh, weapons. But maybe a legal framework could be useful on, on that, because for me, it's clearly an illegal content. And we can link this with, for example, the DSA, the Judicial Services Act, where this content should be removed uh, at the initiative of the online service providers, are they, it's not, uh, it shouldn't be legal to be able to uh, broadcast, let's say, this kind of, uh, of manual. Thank you, Mr. Lekouf. And we now move to the colleague from the European Parliament, Saskia Brickman. Thank you very much. Um, I have several questions. Um, Mr. Lecouf, Le you mentioned that um, the current directive is uh, not uh, properly implemented in all member states. Um, and Mr. Onidi, you mentioned that there is an ongoing recast, but uh, usually we adopt legislation, but we do not focus on its proper implementation. So I, I would like to know if you have more information about uh, member states not uh, respecting the directive? Are there infringement procedures towards those member states or ongoing procedures? Um, Mr. Lecouf, you also mentioned that a firearms intelligence um, hub is being developed uh, at Europol level and that it's an important long-term project. Could you please explain how this new hub will work? Uh, who will compose uh, the hub? Uh, is there also an holistic approach towards uh, illegal trafficking. Um, Mr. Ronidi, Europol helps third countries to register and investigate crimes in this area. How exactly is Europol uh, contributing in this regard? Is it providing trainings, for instance? Uh, if so, in which areas and in which other countries apart from Ukraine and Western Balkans uh, is Europol contributing? And Finally, very quickly, Mr. Duquet, uh, thank you for the picture of the, 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 the situation. Um, I would like to know whether there is further collaboration amongst uh, research community to analyze the root causes of arms trafficking and any good practices that can be uh, shared. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Rani, Mr. Lecouf, Mr. Duquet, one minute each. Thank you. No, on, the, on the implementation, I mean, the implementation of uh, the legal uh, uh, obligations uh, uh, is uh, uh, always a, a dynamic process. Uh, the uh, modernization of the directive on uh, firearms is still uh, quite uh, a recent achievement. So member states, some member states are still actively uh, uh, busy in uh, implementing all the full aspects of this. And uh, we are, of course, very happy to have uh, a European Parliament and uh, very active members of the European Parliament who always uh, remind us on uh, the importance not only to put uh, uh, legislation 
uh, on the table for negotiation, but then to be also very active in uh, uh, ensuring uh, the right uh, uh, transposition. There are a number of uh, uh, infringement cases that have been opened uh, on uh, uh, the finance uh, directive, which was actually a directive that was even opposed. Uh, two member states went to court because they believed their national sovereign rights uh, were encroached. Uh, uh, the Court of Justice uh, uh, did confirm that this was fully in line with uh, uh, EU law. So there are a number of, uh, of uh, dynamic things happening. On the third country cooperation, uh, it is about training, but it is also about uh, um, ensuring proper information flow between uh, uh, third countries uh, and uh, uh, our own jurisdictions. Uh, here, Europol has uh, an important role to facilitate that process, facilitate also the process through many of the representatives of third countries that are actually uh, working in The Hague uh, uh, as guest officers uh, alongside uh, uh, Europol to participate in some of the investigations, to contribute to these uh, uh, investigations. And the third element is uh, to constantly bring uh, the best possible standards we have uh, uh, to be applied also in these uh, uh, third country jurisdictions. And that has been, of course, first and foremost, the uh, focus of our work on the Western Balkan. And uh, we have like a, a fully fledged uh, uh, roadmap uh, involving all Western Balkan uh, uh, countries, which help this uh, process uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to happen. And we're trying to develop similar arrangements uh, with other countries around, uh, uh, around us. Yes, thank you. To answer your question on the, um, on the well on the regulation, I think it has been done by uh, Olivier Unidi. But on the hub, uh, just to uh, a few information to give to you. It's a very technical matter huh, because there are different systems in use. For example, uh, in ballistic side, because we will have two sides. One side on ballistics to help to um, to identify which weapons are fired when and so on. This is very linked to forensic data and so on, most complicated. And on the other side, we have the identification of the seized weapon, especially, to uh, make links and so on. Um, the idea, the basic idea, is that we want to connect the member states' databases. And we want to uh, be able to identify at EU level uh, the, the, which weapons are coming from where and, uh, and so on. The idea is to give leads for investigation. Uh, at the end of the day, what we want to have is a single platform with, uh, uh, with, um, based on the platform that are existing in the member states and connected in uh, Europol with the same kind of criteria that are in the platform in order to identify the weapons. Uh, and see where they are going. So it's why I'm saying that it's a long-term project, because I think it's not easy, because all member states have developed their own databases, so we cannot start from scratch. We need to uh, build on the existing, which is always a bit more difficult. But we see with the evolution that we need also to register. Well, the classic registering of weapons, it's with a uh, a number that is uh, on the weapon and so on. But as you have seen, on 3D weapons, there's no, we uh, there's no number. On some flower weapons, there's no number. Of signal weapons, there's no number. So we need to order criteria to identify. So it's a very technical issue. The idea is to build really a common knowledge. We work also with the uh, Interpol database. Inter uh, Interpol has built a database, iArms on uh, some weapons, which is not completely um, 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 matching with the, the criteria that we need. So it's a very technical uh, issue. We will inform on a regular basis on the development of that. But we cannot expect that this will uh, be created like that. It will be a, a long-term effort by us in Europol and by the member states to build this uh, firearms intelligence hub that we want to build. Thank you. And then to answer your question about uh, possible collaboration for researchers on the root causes of, of firearms trafficking, um, of course, this is a very complex issue. And I think there's a lot of, you know, in general, you have to go to crime prevention uh, as a basic point of it, point of start point. 
Um, and there, of course, you, you have to work on the demand side for firearms. And I think there's a lot of literature on that aspect in itself. Uh, but what we notice, for example, when we talk about political debates, often the supply side is forgotten. And when you talk about drug criminality, there's a lot of focus on drugs. How, can, how are we going to stop drug trafficking? Um, but nobody talks about how to stop firearms trafficking. So the last 10 years, we've seen a growing uh, research specifically on the supply of firearms and different types of firearms trafficking on gun violence. So the picture has improved. Uh, but on the other hand, um, the situation hasn't improved necessarily. Uh, just to give you a small anecdote, when we started doing this research more than 10 years ago, we kind of dismissed the US studies because we thought it was not applicable to us. Because there's much more gun violence, gang violence, that was not something that we saw in Europe. Well, actually today we are revisiting the US studies because in some countries we're actually going to that direction. Um, so this is the negative side. Then again, I'll give you a plus side to end with. Uh, about 10, 15 years ago, there was only a handful of researchers working on this issue. At the moment, there's a big network of researchers, uh, and that's also thanks to the, the, the funding from the European Commission and the support that we've been doing, have been having from the law enforcement community. Only two weeks ago, I was also present at the Impact Firearms meeting. There's a lot of good connections, and there's a good willingness to cooperate uh, with the various actors. So that's the, the positive thing to end this story. Thank you, may I remind everyone to try and stick with the one minute, both for questions and for the answers. Uh, and now we move on to our uh, next speaker uh, from, the France, from the French Assemblée Nationale, uh, Liliana Tangui. You have one minute. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you, Chair. I'd like to have your feedback on uh, progress made in terms of cooperation between Europol and the Balkan countries. Uh, the EU action plan dedicated to, to uh, fighting firearms uh, uh, trafficking, as presented by the Commission in 2020, included specific measures uh, for the Western Balkans. Uh, I am actually busy uh, drafting a report for the Assemblée Nationale on the integration process of Western Balkan uh, states. And it appears that this region is very much exposed to firearms trafficking against the background of the conflict in the Ukraine. In our fight against firearms trafficking, as well as our fight against organized crime, we need to help those countries so that they can fully integrate the EU. It's a major issue at stake for all citizens in the EU. What are the conclusions you can a draw from the implementation of this plant and what is the state of play when it comes to firearms circulating in this part of the, uh, uh, of the European continents? Um, uh, what are uh, uh, the guarantees uh, uh, that ought to be uh, brought forward to legitimate uh, the accession of uh, those countries applying for accession? Deputy. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Madam. Member of the French Parliament would be delighted to be able to provide you with more information as you further draft your report. It is true that the Western Balkan region remains very much exposed to risks linked to uh, organized crime activities, uh, firearms or trafficking being one of those uh, risks and one of those threats looming over the region. But it is one aspect on which uh, we did uh, uh, enhance cooperation. It's one of the first aspects for which we were successful in fully integrating the Balkan countries. Throughout uh, the activities and actions conducted in and by the EU, hence this uh, uh, roadmap that already includes uh, the Balkan uh, states or the Western Balkan states are actually uh, in uh, the EU-led uh, activities. As uh, for uh, legislative approximation, approximation, all those countries uh, uh, have complied now. But the intensity of uh, crime uh, over there makes it uh, unfortunately um, Self-evident that those countries are much exposed, uh, and we're trying to remedy this through operations. But for this, I give the floor to Mr. Lecouf. Merci pour les Thank you very much. I'll be answering the question put by the French MP in, in, in French as well. 
As for the Western Balkans, well, let me tell you that are fully taken on board on our project, more specifically, uh, this project aiming at creating this firearms hub. Indeed, France and the EU uh, made a contribution towards standardizing uh, processes uh, across the six Western Balkan states. So we keep on working while uh, taking them fully on board because this is one of those regions uh, where uh, many uh, firearms uh, originate before uh, circulating on EU uh, territory. Uh, I forgot to, to, to say this, uh, but uh, let me also answer Mrs. Brickman. Those countries are fully on board our project. Uh, and indeed, uh, uh, in the shorter or longer term, uh, we are toying with the idea of integrating, fully integrating our uh, Ukrainian counterparts. Uh, of course, uh, uh, those uh, uh, weapons circulate uh, uh, more readily on the road than uh, uh, through other uh, uh, media. We we're trying to take a helicopter view and be as comprehensive as possible. Regarding the Western Balkans, again, where all the countries are part of the Weapons and Explosive Analysis Project, and they are active uh, uh, contributors uh, to the impact uh, pri priority for firearms as uh, led uh, by Spain. And those Western Balkan countries uh, are uh, uh, in a prime position as contributors to so this uh, issue of firearms in this particular part of uh, Europe has been fully integrated and it's nothing new. We've been collaborating with them for years. And I'll stop here. Next uh, question from uh, our Greek colleague, Konstantina Giannakopoulou. Further to the legislative framework and coordinated European efforts and actions, I think that it would be worthwhile to thoroughly look into the cultivation and normalization of a culture of violence which is prominent and exposed in social media and brings forth the issue of juvenile delinquency, especially regarding illegal gun possession and use. Which actions should Europe undertake in order to minimize the negative effects of the cultivation of violence on youths? Thank you. And for the replies? Maybe, maybe I can give you, a, well, not a full action because it's not in the remit of Europol really to uh, uh, fight against this, but for the understanding of what happens, what we see uh, is that criminal networks are using these young people uh, to uh, commit violence with firearms. To be clear, the, 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 the bosses of this uh, criminal organization, they provide weapons, they put these weapons in the hands of uh, young criminals, asking them to prove that they are able to enter in the organization, and they have to prove this by using these guns for violence purposes. And we see that these youngsters that are affiliated to this criminal group they are used also, if I can say that in this way, they are used as weapons also. They put their weapons in, the, in their hands and then after they start, uh, these younger people, their early life in uh, violence and crime and it's for sure uh, needed to have an action to try to counter uh, this and your, your question is particularly relevant in this uh, remit and maybe yeah, maybe just to add, what we also see is not only that um, young people are being used by older criminals to do the shootings, but we also see that when they actually act out these horrible acts of violence, they take pictures of them, they make videos of them, they put them online, and they make it very attractive that they are able to do so. So I really share your concern about the normalization of violence, and very specifically, for example, with 3D printed firearms, the question whether they will become very attractive or not also depends on popular culture. Um, uh, if a few years ago, having a 3D printed firearms was not something that you get a reputation for. That means that you didn't get good access to real guns. 
But what do we see the, the last couple of years? We see 3D printed firearms in TV shows, in video games, and so on. So it becomes much more popular and therefore might actually attract people to go to the 3D printing and increase the problem of 3D printing. So I, I really follow your concern there. Thank you. And we now move on to our colleague from the European Parliament, Asita Kanko. Thank you very much. Uh, um, look, I wish I wasn't using these words to qualify events that uh, happened in Brussels, like shootings, stab stabbings, uh, repetitive terror attacks, and the terrorists of October 23 even, even um, kind of assembled his weapon in the middle of the street, like you know, like you would just go somewhere and buy browning, it's really not okay. Um, when you speak to the people who live in Brussels today, of course they don't feel safe. Um, of course they are worried about the future. I agree with uh, with you, uh, Ms. Onidi, that the frame, the legal framework has given more space and has expanded, has adapted to to, to the needs of society and law enforcement uh, agencies, but. Uh, the, the law enforcement is the key issue here. I know that Europol is doing great work, our police uh, officers are doing great work, but we also know that younger people do not want to engage in the police anymore because it's not, very, it's not safe to be a police agent like in a city like Brussels. Um, and the, the, attracti the, 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 the job is not attractive anymore to them and uh, the police lack support. When you arrest a criminal and you see them the next day uh, in the street, it doesn't work. Besides, even journalists, politicians, police people are f threatened in Brussels. That's just one example. You can, you can take Rotterdam or other areas as well. But the key point here is how do you protect your cities when you don't even know who is living there? We have seen reports a couple of days ago where we see places in areas in Brussels where you have illegal migrants who are staying there, who are using weapons, who are guarding entire neighborhoods, even younger, younger teenagers and selling drugs on playgrounds, and the police cannot go there, journalists cannot go there. So my question concretely is, how do we um, kind of resolve the gap between all the legal um, tools that we, we have today and the law enforcement issue that we are facing? What would we be able to tell our citizens? Of course, we can continue Thank improving you. it. Thank we you. Well, I think I mean, we, we, we work very closely now and Ms. Kanko on, 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 many, on many issues. I think part of, part of the answer is uh, to try to organize uh, a European space which is conducive to more cooperation between different actors. And, and uh, in terms of like the law enforcement angle of that, we do have a common house which is uh, Europol, which we try on a regular basis to strengthen, because we see the positive effects of what is being done uh, uh, through uh, this uh, agency. Another uh, response is, uh, uh, through the different uh, policy angles we have been working on, is to try also to get the different sides of society, different administrations, to actually work uh, uh, more together. And, and this, yeah, between the asylum uh, uh, agencies, between uh, the border guards, between the police, for the information to be shared and also for our information systems to actually be at the disposal of these different uh, uh, services. Uh, Jean-Philippe mentioned the features of uh, uh, the Schengen information system being an information system that aggregates very useful information, including on uh, firearms that, uh, uh, that are declared as uh, being stolen or, or missed. And uh, in the different uh, uh, reforms uh, of uh, systems, information systems, we try to each time embed the obligations for this uh, to be uh, broadly available to different uh, branches of the uh, administration. So I think beyond the law, there is this capacity to progressively incentivize the cooperation be between different uh, uh, authorities. Yeah, maybe 30 seconds just to add something that will not come as a surprise for you, but, uh, well, in Europol, we advocate for timely exchange of information. One of the problems that we have is that these incidents are seen as isolated. Mm -hmm. Isolated in an area, in a city, in a region, or even in a country, but they are not. They are linked with uh, criminal networks that are beyond the borders, beyond the borders of the city of Brussels, in, in the case beyond the border of Belgium, beyond sometimes the border of the EU. 
So it's why we in Europol always believe that exchange of information, sending the information to Europol in order that we are able to make the links is one of the key features. Technical information, uh, uh, data on uh, what happened, who was uh, holding the weapon, where the weapon was provided, and so on. We have all the legal framework to do that. We have a new legal framework since uh, 2022 uh, to do that and to collect this data and to use this data to make links. This is really one of the key. Thank you. We now move on to our colleague from the Polish Senate, Gregorz Fedorowicz. Thank you very much. The recent trafficking of firearms poses a significant threat, often intertwined with various forms of organized crime. The well documents nexus between firearms trafficking and migrant smuggling add to the complexity of the issue. Disturbing reports highlights uh, these inactivities occurring along the southern border uh, of the European Union and uh, in the Western Balkans. Give the acknowledged uh, correlation between the trafficking of firearms uh, and organized crime, particularly in connection with uh, migrants smuggling. I would like to ask Jean-Philippe Lecoff about the existing analysis on the eastern border of the European Union, including Belarus. Are there any known links between the trafficking of migrants and weapons in this region? Thank you, Mr. Lecoff. Well, to, uh, to answer your question um, is, is, is quite difficult. Well, I will start to say that in Europol we can assess and we can make uh, analysis on what we know. It sounds like an evidence, but uh, I think it's good to recall. All that we don't know, all the information that are not shared with us, we cannot analyze. So uh, what we have seen is that we have seen that the smugglers migrant smugglers are using weapons more and more, including against uh, law enforcement officers. We have seen, um, in, I have example in mind, in Hungary, in Bulgaria, in uh, Serbia, these migrant smugglers uh, not hesitating at shooting at the, at the police forces. Uh, uh, that tries to uh, make uh, arrest and control. I don't see a link with the, when I see a link, it's with the, between the smugglers and the weapons. I don't see a link with the migrants and the weapons. Uh, specifically to your uh, question about Belarus, uh, I have no information uh, clearly where I can uh, state that there are something organized at that level. We are monitoring that. Doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. It means that I don't have information about that. Thank you. Thank you. We now move on to the next uh, speaker from the Romanian parliament, Marian Julian Rasaliu. Thank you very much. Mr. Deputy Executive uh, Director uh, Lacouf, dear colleagues. The Romanian police is developing uh, constantly the cooperation with Ukraine and Moldova through study visits and uh, shared best practice uh, regarding the operationalization of uh, national firearms focal point. As we observed uh, from the three study visits uh, that uh, took place in Bucharest, the Ukrainian and Moldavian partners are eager to enhance their capabilities and uh, share information with the uh, European uh, community. That uh, question, the question that I would like to address to Mr. Lecouf is, what is the state 
of play when it uh, comes to the synchronization of the Ukrainian and Moldavian firearms register with the European database. Thank you very much. You, Mr. Elikov, you have the floor. Yes. Um, uh, well, thank you for your question. Well, for sure, we, are, um, we have a special attention to especially Moldova, and uh, upon the request of the Commission, but also because we see Moldova as uh, one of the key um, uh, country when we speak about the consequences of the war in Ukraine. We know that uh, our Romanian colleagues are doing a lot also to support in proximity uh, uh, Moldova. Um, we um, have sent two uh, guest officers to Moldova that are permanently in Kisino, and uh, we also try to uh, improve the level of exchange of information uh, with them. Um, the information that we receive on uh, weapons uh, trafficking are um, uh, not that important for the time being, but we hope to develop uh, uh, them, and they are taken in the same movement, let's say, that what we do with, uh, with Ukraine. But uh, it's more, let's say, uh, difficult to achieve uh, due to uh, some organizational issues with, uh, with Moldova. But we are working on that. Huh? Thank and you. Maybe I know that, I yeah, I know that Mr. Ducroix wanted to come in on the previous uh, question, and maybe if any of the panelists would like to intervene with regards to the last two or three questions. Thank you. I would like to, to intervene on the question on uh, the linkages between firearms trafficking and human and migrant smuggling. Now, there are clear interlinkages between organized crime and firearms trafficking. That's very clear. Um, there are often also some seizures uh, amongst the traffickers themselves of, of migrants and of human, uh, humans, but um, to our knowledge, this is not because they're trafficking the weapons for profit, but they're using them as instruments for force. So this is what we are seeing at the moment. Uh, when there are uh, combined seizures of different types of commodities, it's drugs and firearms. That's the connection we often see. And this also brings me to the, the, the question before that from Mrs. Kanko about the enforcement of legislation. This is where we see one of the key elements uh, that, that really hurts is when there's a seizure of drugs and firearms, the drugs are often investigated. Where are they coming from? What are the networks? The firearms are very often not investigated, uh, and which means that um, no investigation, no tracing, which means we don't know which network is behind that specific type of trafficking and so on. So if we can have case-bound intelligence, but not really strategic intelligence. And in order to change that, we have to work on the awareness raising for local police officers and give them enough resources and capacity to actually do those kinds of investigations. They might not seem uh, practical in the short term, but in the long term, this is exactly what we need uh, of that kind of data so we can enforce the legislation much better. If, if I can take 10 seconds just to add to what Mr. Duque said, because I think it's key. It's true that the weapons trafficking are not investigating when you are investigating drug trafficking. And it's the same movement for the financial investigation, yeah. something that we uh, always underline. When you work on a traffic, whatever the traffic it is, you have to see uh, the traffic itself, drugs, the weapons that are used to do this trafficking and where the money that is earned from this trafficking is going. So it's really uh, difficult, I know, from the, the national police forces, but we need each time to have a kind of a holistic approach of the phenomena. If not, we are concentrated. And sometimes our own internal organization doesn't help because we have drug investigation units and they are interested by drugs, weapons investigation units, financial investigation units, and we have some difficulties to make them work together. It's why also we have created this concept of operational task forces in Europol, in order also that to have a holistic approach towards the phenomena. Thank you. Just br briefly to, to come back to uh, Ukraine and uh, Moldova. The, the two thematics you, we, we, we are discussing this afternoon, actually, uh, the two thematics we focused on uh, uh, immediately 
after the Russian aggression on, uh, on Ukraine. It was firearms and uh, trafficking of human beings, uh, which were seen immediately as the two uh, like uh, immediate and uh, uh, most important threats. Uh, in terms of the support to uh, Moldova under the leadership of Commissioner Johansson, who just entered the room, <laughs> we set up uh, uh, the so-called uh, um, security hub. And the first thematic discussion within this hub was actually on firearms. Uh, and uh, we immediately got a positive response by uh, uh, Moldova uh, on uh, the nomination of this focal point on firearms. Same on the Ukraine side, same on both Moldova and Ukraine, we managed to get them uh, to actually uh, develop a register, a national register for all firearms, but those registers are not yet connected uh, uh, to Europol. Uh, this will come, and this we want uh, uh, to uh, happen, but we're still uh, uh, supporting those two countries to ensure, first and foremost, that there is a comprehensive, the best possible and most comprehensive possible uh, amount of data, of quality data in these registries before we actually formally connect those to our own systems. Thank you. We will now move to our last uh, person who has requested to speak, who is uh, from the Slovenian Parliament, Mr. Miroslav Gregoric. Uh, thank you. I have a question to Mr. Uh, Lekouf. Uh, it was mentioned uh, during the, this presentation that uh, Ukraine shared a database with uh, 440 lost and stolen arms. Uh, I'm concerned uh, not, uh, well, as well for the small arms, but I'm concerned for the uh, man portable missiles against aircraft and against uh, other object tanks, for instance. And also, I'm uh, very much concerned about uh, suicide drones. So my question is, uh, does this database of 440 uh, stolen and missing weapons, uh, of which only 2.4% were seized, uh, does this contain also uh, this uh, suicide drone and uh, manned portable missiles? And the, the last question unrelated to this is, is there some uh, action or some program inside the Europol to track uh, homemade explosives. Thank you. So thank you for your question. Um, well, on the, we are, our, what is important to uh, understand is our partner in Ukraine are uh, the law enforcement agencies especially the National Police of Ukraine. So uh, for what you are talking about, that is to say um, man pads, uh, as it's called, uh, it's much more, it's rely much on the military side on one side and on the intelligence services on the other side. So it's not an information that is uh, in the police databases and they are sharing with us their police data, their law enforcement data. So uh, we don't have information on that that are included in, in the, the information that they send to us. Uh, nevertheless, if we heard something about that, for sure, as uh, we, we are conscious that this can be a, a, a high level threat, especially for terrorist action, and we will act upon this if we have any information on that. To answer your last question um, on, um, uh, on the homemade explosives, it's part of, the, of the, um, the mandate of our analysis project on weapons and explosives. So yes, we are monitoring also uh, this, including the recipes uh, to, um, um, to create, to manufacture these explosives. And I was referring previously about this manual to uh, print uh, 3D weapons. We had also a uh, terrorist identification task force where we uh, have targeted uh, all that is online, that is the recipes to um, um, manufacture homemade explosives also. So it's part of uh, our job. 
Thank you very much, and that concludes the speaker list. I will now pass the floor back to Mr. Metsu to conclude this debate. Thank you, JPSG delegates, Mr. Onidi. Thank you, Mr. Le Couf, Mr. Duque. Um, I think all uh, answers were given. Unfortunately, we don't have the time for a proper break. If you do need a coffee or some, uh, some extra water, please feel free to go to the coffee corner. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Commissioner Johansson already to come to the stage, and Ms. Schmidt, who enters now, she's also very welcome to join the panel. Uh, Mr. Lecouf is already there. But again, Mr. Onidi, Mr. Duquet, thank you so much for your attendance. Thank you. So, dear colleagues, um, we now move on to our next agenda item, which will see the keynote speech by Commissioner Ilva Johansson, um, Home Affairs Commissioner. So, Commissioner, you have the floor for 15 minutes. At the same time, we'll have the change in the panel. Good afternoon. It's uh, great to be here. It's great to meet you and to do this in this inspiring location, but also in this important moment in time. A time when the threat posed by organized crime, drugs crime, is bigger than ever. Last year, more than 600 explosions in the Netherlands in Sweden, 350 shootings, killing 53 people. And more than 300 children aged 15 to 17 charged with murder or attempt murder in Sweden alone. Children killing children. 50% of murders in the European Union are linked to drugs and drug trafficking. Drug traffickers killed a journalist, a lawyer in the Netherlands, and are threatening politicians in several member states. These are direct attacks on our democracies. It's time to realize organized crime is as big a threat as a threat to our society as terrorism. And we need to counter this threat with the same determination. So it's good that the last four years, the EU has made big steps forwards on security. Much bigger steps than anyone expected four years ago when we started this mandate, actually. And to a very large part, this is thanks to Europol. One recent big step forward is the European Ports Alliance a public-private partnership in the fight against organized crime and drug trafficking. Because it takes a network to fight a network. Minister Verlinden were there at the launch. Annelise, we have already built an excellent cooperation in the fight against drug, drugs crime. We traveled to South America together, and I look forward to our continuing uh, work under your presidency. And Catherine de Bol was there, of course. Catherine, one of the great honors of my mandate so far was to work with you as executive director of Europol on our shared mission to keep Europe safe. Europol is key to Ports Alliance, and we are building a network also across the Atlantic from where the drugs depart towards Europe. We visited Colombia and Ecuador, and fourth in Latin American interior ministers came to Brussels last September. Ecuador started a working arrangement with Europol last October, resulting last week in a first joint operational success against the cocaine trafficking network. 31 arrests in Spain and Ecuador, two criminal bosses arrested high-value targets, nearly 50 million euro in property frozen. Can I put this away? Yeah. And agreements to exchange personal data with Europol 
are now being negotiated with Ecuador, with Bolivia, with Brazil, with Mexico, and with Peru. To take the cooperation to the next level, and progress in these negotiations are good. In the last four years, we had to deal with unexpected threats. COVID, of course, and war. War is a catastrophe for people, but an opportunity for criminals. We were faced with the unexpected security risks caused by Russia's war of aggression uh, in Ukraine. Risks that are on your agenda today. Trafficking in human beings, criminal targeting vulnerable women and children for sexual exploitation. We are countering this threat, working with member states, with Ukraine, the EU anti-trafficking coordinator, of course, Diane Smith, which is here with us today, and Europol, of course. Europol is vital in the fight against trafficking of human beings, offering analysis, financial crime investigation, and linking up national expertise and investigations. So far, there are very, relatively few cases and few victims of trafficking among refugees from Ukraine, but we have to stay vigilant. And the potential threat resulting from Putin's war, the trafficking of firearms, we just heard the question here on that topic. Criminals hoping to smuggle weapons from the battlefield as happened after the war in the Balkans. Europol has an excellent operational cooperation with Ukraine and Ukraine police. They, they are key partner for the commission in working with Ukraine to counter the spread of firearms. And so far, we have seen very few firearms entering into the EU. Our cooperation with Ukrainian is Ukrainians is excellent, but of course this could change, especially when the war one day is over. So this is why we have to continue to build a very strong cooperation on this topic. Europol is the beating heart of police cooperation and information exchange in Europe. And in the last four years, I made sure to stress this role in all the legislation and initiatives I put forward. For example, plugging Europol into the PRUM network for police information exchange, which was voted into law just two weeks ago by the European Parliament. And that will allow for, allow for faster, more efficient, and more kinds of police data checks. But our biggest step forward for Europol is the adoption of the new mandate that I proposed, allowing Europol to meet the new challenges of our time and better support member states' police, confirming Europol is allowed to process big data with a reinforced data protection framework as well as stronger oversight, crucial for today's crime criminal investigations. Like the arrest of a Croatian narco boss last October in Istanbul, the arrest of this high value target followed an investigation into large scale cocaine trafficking. An investigation supported by Europol with information exchange, analytical support, and operational support. Or the arrest of five suspected far right terrorists after an international operation supported by Europol. The suspects were accused of sharing extremist propaganda and manuals for printing 3D weapons. Or an anti-corruption investigation resulting in the freezing of more than 5 million euro in assets. All of these, all of these operations, they operate, in, in all of these, the, the operation of analysis of big data was key to success. But this is not the last of the changes to the mandate. Crime never stops. Law enforcement must stay ahead. A few months ago, I launched a global coalition against migrant smuggling. And I also proposed targeted amendments to the Europol regulation, so Europol can fully support the global fight. With 50 million extra in budget and 50 new posts for Europol, with Eurojust, Eurojust and Frontex liaison officers at the European Centre Against Migrant Smuggling, 
and better support through operational task forces and deployment on the ground. Necessary changes that I'm sure will bring big results in the fight against migrant smugglers. And I count on your support to make it happen. Last year, more than 3,000 people lost their lives in the Mediterranean. The smugglers don't care at all about the migrants' lives. We need to fight the smugglers. We need to turn the political commitment to counter the smugglers into operational results on the ground. And that's why we also need this targeted amendment of the regulation. We also need Europol to face new challenges, future challenges. The malicious use of artificial intelligence. It's clear generative AI can do amazing things. Write convincing texts in seconds, create realistic photos in an instant, and now even videos. Last week we saw the launch of Sora, maybe you've seen it, a text to video AI model. All you need to do is to write a few sentences and out comes a video. People on a market in Lagos in Nigeria, waves breaking on the cliffs in the golden light of the setting sun. There is nothing to suggest it's not real. AI can be a real benefit to humanity, can bring great progress in medicine and science, we rely only on, we are really only in the beginning of this revolution. But unfortunately, right from the start, people are also looking for opportunities to corrupt AI, to abuse it for malicious and criminal purposes. Last December, Germany uncovered a Russian disinformation campaign. 50,000 fake accounts spewing out one million messages against the government. That would be so much easier with AI. And we already see AI being used to commit fraud and even to create child sexual abuse material. Last year, the Internet Watch Foundation found 3,000 images of child sexual abuse created by AI in one month alone. Of these, more than 500 were the worst kinds, rapes and torture of small children. Deep fake is not the right word, because the rapes are real. The AI is trained on existing pictures and videos of real rapes of real small children to create new pictures and new videos of rapes. This is not chat GPT, this is rape GPT. There is a danger that police will be flooded with pictures of fake children and unable to rescue the real children because the pictures are already so real. And this is only the beginning. We need to stop the criminal use of AI from spiraling out of control. Europol's Innovation Lab organized workshops last year to explore criminal use of AI and how AI can benefit law enforcement. The new AI Act makes it possible for law enforcement to develop AI to counter terrorism and organized crime and identify victims. We will need AI to fight AI. And its new mandate allows Europol to develop and test artificial intelligence for law enforcement. New horizons for law enforcement also means new horizons for you. As elected politicians, you will also be confronted with the impact of disinformation by artificial intelligence. It's only a matter of time. And as members of this group, you will be part of the debate on how to counter criminal AI. A debate that is just only beginning. I wish you the best in helping to shape this debate. A debate that will be extremely important for the safety of our citizens and of our children. Thank you very much.
Thank you for this keynote speech, dear colleagues. Thank you for your attention. That concludes this agenda item now uh, for the second scrutiny session, which will be on combating trafficking in human beings. Passing the floor to co-chair, Mr. Engler. Thank you. And for the second scrutiny session on combating trafficking in human beings, we are now joined by Ms. Diane Schmidt, the EU Anti-Trafficking Coordinator at the Director General for Migration and Home Affairs of the European Commission. Um, we also welcome back Mr. Jean-Philippe Lecouf, Deputy Executive Director of Europol in charge of the Operations Directorate. You will both have 10 minutes each for your presentation before we open the floor to questions for the JPSG delegates, uh, who I kindly invite to press the microphone button if they want the floor after the two um, presentations that we have so that then we can move on to the questions and answer sessions from your end. So, Ms. Schmidt, I will give you the floor first. You now have the floor for up to 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, Commissioner, Minister, uh, dear Catherine de Bull. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here. I'm very happy also that you have chosen to have a session on trafficking in human beings. And um, I took office as EU anti-trafficking coordinator, thanks to the proposal of Commissioner Eva Johansson, one, two and a half years ago. And I realized very quickly how important uh, the role of Europol is in this combat against trafficking in human beings. Beca because Europol is contributing really to make a difference on the ground through the operational support to member states, but also non-EU countries. And this helps to identify victims, but also to stop traffickers. This is very concrete, and there are a lot of examples on this. But Europol also helps to, uh, with intelligence, with identifying trends and modus operandi, uh, which is so important also for policymakers and for those who prepare legislation, who give the financial support, or who define the priorities in relation to operational actions in order to take the, the right decisions. I will uh, say a few words about the situation in the European Union uh, based on the latest data which was released uh, less than a month ago by Eurostat and which is coming from contributions from the different member states. Uh, this data covers um, 2022 and we see important changes compared to the situation in 2021. These changes are already taken into account in the different strategies at EU and national level, but not completely. And so uh, it's clear that they deserve uh, some attention. First, the number of detected and registered victims uh, has increased by 41% in 2022 compared to 2021. Um, is this a worrying trend? Yes, of course, because of course, uh, uh, too many victims are too much, uh, and this would not happen. But on the other hand, it's probably also linked that, to the fact that there was more awareness raising in member states, which helps to detect victims. And 2022, as you might remember, is also the year where the military aggression against Ukraine started. So many people arriving in the European Union, and a lot of actions were taken at national level in order to inform about the risk of trafficking. But it's probably also due to the increase on investigations, uh, because during the investigation, obviously, you, you identify victims. For example, also Europol um, coordinated uh, joint action days in, in June 2023, where 261 victims were identified uh, in the context of food and delivery services, beauty salons, transport, and construction sectors. The European Labour Authority also was involved in um, several operations, which is new and which is also welcome. And there I would also welcome that at national level, more and more the Labour Authorities, but also the Labour Inspectors are involved in combating trafficking in human beings, which was not so much the case in the past. It's not yet the case in all the member states, but I think we should, uh, we should also continue to push for this. Um, second point is that we see that the percentage of uh, sexual exploitation and the percentage of labor exploitation are uh, more or less similar, meaning 41% each of them, which is also completely new because in the past it was always sexual exploitation, which was the majority, 
uh, and labor exploitation uh, far behind. Um, the, for victims of sexual exploitation, there is an increase of 5.3%. For labor exploitation, there is an increase, I mean, it doubled compared to the situation in 2021. 20, uh, it's clear that we have to look more at labor exploitation, at uh, the profits, illegal profits uh, done through forced labor, how criminal organizations uh, are acting, uh, in order to infiltrate the legal economy, especially in high-risk sectors. Labor exploitation is also on the agenda of the next meeting with uh, the coordinators from all the member states dealing with trafficking human beings in June, a meeting which I hope uh, share with uh, the Belgian presidency. The third point, which is also important, is that we see an increase of other forms of trafficking, uh, for example, uh, forced begging, forced criminality, uh, organ trafficking. And uh, when the authorities are confronted, uh, for example, with forced criminality or with forced begging, it's often very difficult to have evidence for the prosecution and the for conviction of traffickers. This is also why we have to look a little bit closer to forced uh, criminality. And uh, it was just mentioned also in relation to drugs trafficking that uh, young uh, people are of, often also uh, uh, brought into this, and sometimes there's also false criminality behind uh, it. There's a recent case in France um, of exploitation of unaccompanied minors from Morocco, manipulated and put under drugs by Algerian traffickers and forced to steal from tourists. And uh, six Algerian were behind this crime, forcing these young boys uh, to commit crimes, and these Algerians were sentenced in January to prison. Uh, we have to go after the traffickers in order to stop them. Children in general represent 15% of the victims. Uh, previously it was 24%. We have also want to understand why this is the case. It might also be linked to the fact that uh, the prosecutions and the victims are also now considered as victims, for example, of sex, uh, child sexual abuse, and that it's not considered as, as trafficking anymore. As regards the, the gender perspective, the majority are still women. Um, a word about um, traffickers and perpetrators. Um, the data on suspects, prosecution and conviction is as previously uh, not very good. It's still too low. And even it decreased uh, in uh, 2022 as regards the suspects, which is a decrease of 16.4%. Uh, and also there are less uh, people who have been convicted. Uh, which means also that law enforcement and judicial cooperation is uh, very important from the beginning of an investigation. Here, um, also the, the role of Europol and of Eurojust is extremely important. I noticed to, during different visits to, to member states that um, sometimes the authorities are not aware about the support they can get from the agencies. And I would also like to underline what was just said before also by uh, Jean-Philippe Lecouf, that it is important to, uh, to provide information to Europol, because it's only like this that you, you know uh, if a case is isolated uh, or linked to a network which is active in different member states and to understand better the, the situation. Together also with Eurojust, uh, we have, uh, yes, with Eurojust, we have put uh, into place a focus group of specialized prosecutors linked, dealing with trafficking in human beings in order to reinforce also the cooperation um, between uh, the prosecutors. And uh, I think we should also look in how uh, judicial authorities and prosecutors can be better associated uh, to the impact work. Finally, as regards the citizenship of, of victims, there is uh, a big change because uh, 2022 data shows that an increase of uh, victims coming from non-EU countries they represent now the majority of the victims, 63%, uh, while before EU citizens uh, represented the majority of victims in the EU, often trafficked within their own country. As you know, trafficking in human beings does not necessarily imply the crossing of a border. But this shows also again how the cooperation with non-EU countries is important, 
and also here the agreements um, between uh, Europol and non-EU countries uh, can help um, in this regard. The main countries of origin are Nigeria, Ukraine, Morocco, Bangladesh, Colombia, Brazil, Pakistan, China. We see an increase of uh, victims from Latin America countries. Uh, but I mentioned also Ukraine. Ukraine was in two 2022 number one of country of origin of non-EU victims. There, is, uh, there was a, a considerable, considerable increase in 2022, mainly in relation to labor exploitation. 86% uh, of victims have been identified. Sexual exploitation is 52% of, sorry, 13%. Um, we have done a preliminary assessment to see if there is a link with those who uh, uh, came to the European Union uh, in order to uh, flee the, the military aggression. But it seems that most of the cases are related to investigations which started already in 2021 and related to uh, Ukrainian citizens already present in the European Union. But uh, this means also we have to continue to take uh, the risk extremely seriously as Commissioner uh, Johansson also just said, and we have to continue with preventive measures, but also with um, uh, exchange of information, um, and I'm also in contact with the Ukrainian authorities in relation to this. Um, this uh, example shows again that we have to continue the comprehensive approach, which starts by prevention, demand reduction, includes, of course, every effort which, which can be done in order to prosecute and convict traffickers, while protecting victims at all stages. And this is also the approach which is taken by the EU Anti-Trafficking Directive, uh, which was now um, uh, modified on the basis of a proposal of the Commission in a little bit more than one year. The European Parliament and the Council managed to find an agreement on uh, uh, the reinforcement of uh, the directive, so it will be adopted formally in the next weeks. Um, it will allow to have stronger rules for law enforcement and judicial authorities. It will include for the first time as forms of exploitation, surrogacy, forced marriages, illegal adoption. It will make reference to the online dimension, which uh, we know trafficking is going more and more online, uh, with aggravating circumstances when it relates to sexual exploitation. It, um, it will also include one very important change, which is um, the criminalization of the users um, of uh, services provided by victims of trafficking when they know that it's a victim of trafficking. And this does not relate only to sexual exploitation, this relates also to labor exploitation, and I think it's a very big step forward, uh, this criminalization of the users, because obviously this will also help to reduce the demand. There are uh, other points which I will not raise now. Only a, uh, one important point again is awareness raising. Uh, I think with awareness raising we can make a difference. And the Olympic Games in, in Paris are also an occasion to raise awareness. And uh, in Paris now, uh, in France, uh, a group of NGOs has already launched a, a big campaign in, in order to raise awareness about trafficking human beings. We have also to work more closely with the private sector, online companies, but also high-risk sectors. And uh, we have also to look at, uh, at the links between trafficking and other crimes like smuggling, drugs, trafficking, and so on, and go after the, the high-risk targets. Um, the Commissioner mentioned also the new regulation that I will uh, stop here to reinforce uh, the European cent Center Against Migrant Smuggling at Europol. This center is also dealing with trafficking, and we should not uh, forget uh, this. Uh, reinforcing the center would also reinforce our actions against trafficking human beings. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ms. Schmidt, for your presentation. Now we move to the presentation of Mr. Lacouf. The floor is yours for 10 minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Well, I will give you um, um, uh, an overview of what we have seen from Europol based on the cases that we have supported uh, on this question of uh, combating trafficking in human beings. Well, first, I must mention, I think I have a, a PowerPoint that will be 
uh, on the screen uh, shortly. Thank you very much. Um, first, to say that this trafficking in human beings remains one of the key threats to the internal security of Europe because of the victims, uh, for sure, and the money that it is provided. What we see from the cases that we have supported is that um, uh, the most reported types of uh, THB, as we say, uh, trafficking in human beings, continues to be sexual exploitation and labor exploitation. Uh, and we anticipate that this will continue um, in, in the future. Or whether all the types of exploitation are also relevant, for instance, false begging and uh, false criminality. Most EU victims of THB that we have seen in the cases we are supporting are uh, in the EU are originated from the EU. Uh, but we see an increase of non-European victims, particularly uh, from Latin America and Asian country. And it shows that we have some intelligence gap, for example, with African countries. We don't, have in, we don't support investigation, as we know that some, for example, Nigerian criminal networks are active in, uh, for example, sexual exploitation. But we don't see that in the case that we are supporting. It means that we have an intelligence gap somewhere. Uh, it is more uh, frequent for criminal networks to hide their activities behind alleged business agreement that they convince the victim to enter into. Uh, this creates the appearance of a kind of a legitimacy of this uh, relation. More and more, also the digital domain, and I will come back to that, play, plays an integral part in the trafficking in human beings. Traffickers used online environment for recruitment, advertisement of services, and to transfer their criminal uh, profit. Th this provides anonymity to the traffickers and the exploiters and help them to evade attention. You can see on the next slide um, the, precisely the breakdown of the reported form of THB in the cases that we have supported uh, in Europol in uh, 2023. Um, let me now give you an example of a successful operation that highlights some of the trends that I just mentioned. This is the OTF called Lotus. Uh, it focused on Chinese criminal networks sexually exploiting Chinese nationals in the EU. More specifically, it led to the dismantlement of an, organ, an international sex trafficking ring that held hundreds of Chinese women trapped in debt bondage across Europe. It is the biggest hit to date against Chinese human trafficking in Europe. The criminal networks had set up a prostitution ring by luring victims to Europe by the promise of a legitimate, legitimate job. They used popular messaging apps in China to lure their victim and would then smuggle them to Europe using forged EU ID documents or falsified residence permits. Once in Europe, the victims were held in bondage and forced to work as prostitutes to pay off debts. The investigation was initiated by the Belgium authorities in 2020 after the murders of one of these women. Of these women. After that, the most affected countries established an OTF in 2021, and in 2022 and 2023, successful action days resulted in the arrest of 38 suspects, the identification of numerous victims, the seizure of over 2 million euros and the seizure of nearly 300 mobile phones. Following the action day, the activity on the online platform used by the traffickers crashed significantly. This OTF and the investigation continues to produce intelligence. 
Just an example to show you uh, this. In terms of uh, trends, this OTF also has shown that first the victims are recruited on Chinese speaking instant messaging and social media platforms. To transport the victims to the EU, the uh, criminal networks often rely on travel agencies based in China, arranging the air travel and the issuing of tourist or working visa needed to enter the EU. The criminal networks also provide counterfeited passports and visa for high of high quality for that victims use to travel in the EU. Criminal networks provide victims with fraudulent documents in order to apply for a residence permit. And Chinese THB criminal networks maintain a physical and psychological control over their victims while avoiding the use of violence. Criminals take advantage of victims' economical needs and manipulate them into accepting seemingly advantageous long-term business arrangement. The digital environment is present at every stage of the process for the recruitment, from the recruitment to the exploitation. Another operational example I want to highlight uh, is the operation mobile or mobile. This THB case related to forced begging, forced marriage, and forced criminality. This investigation carried out by Serbia. Austria, France, and Germany, with the Europol support, looked into a family-based criminal network trafficking minors and young women. The criminal networks from Serbia trafficked their biological children as well as children or young women with whom they had family ties. The victims were minors between the age of five to 17, <clears throat> as well as young women. <clears throat> Sorry. The suspects had allegedly forced the minors to beg and to commit crimes in Serbia, Austria, France, and Germany. Investigative leads indicate that the suspects also sold victims to other perpetrators located outside Serbia. A coordinated operation took place in Serbia and led to the arrest of five suspects, the identification of eight victims, and the seizure of, among other things, cash. Europol supported the operational activities, facilitates the exchange of information, and provided analytical support to this case. On the action day, Europol deployed experts to Serbia to cross-check operational information in real time and support investigators on the ground. The law enforcement community continues to face a number of challenges we are looking to identify and disrupt THB. First, the phenomena remains under the radar as many cases are not reported by victims. This is particularly true when victims come from outside the EU or when victims are coerced into business agreement. Additionally, detection remains challenging in large part due to the extensive use of the online domain by traffickers and exploiters. In the past, it was, or it can be in the street. Now, it's everything happens online. Another issue that adds to this challenge is the fact that leaders of THB criminal networks tend to operate from outside the EU through what they call remote control and coordination. They keep the control over the criminal business and the overall process of trafficking in human beings while reducing their visibility to law enforcement authorities. Finally, detection remains difficult due to the fact that sexual and labor exploitation is often conducted through or hidden in a legal business structure. Overall, traffickers and exploiters have been keen 
have been sorry, known to be highly adaptable, making them harder to identify and disrupt. Towards this, what is the Europol response? Europol has dedicated an analysis project in supporting member states in fighting uh, trafficking in human beings. In 2023, this AP, Phoenix, it's uh, the name of the AP, conducted 59 operations, 23 action days, and produced 220 and 32 operational reports. Europol further produced regular analysis on the threat, and this is the report that you see on the screen. THB is also an impact priority. Our uh, response is also consolidated, consolidated through the online uh, monitoring, through the uh, internet referral unit uh, and uh, of this phenomena. The increased cooperation with non-EU countries, especially transit and or source countries of these uh, poor victims, it is challenging, but sometimes we have seen some progress in this cooperation with third countries and uh, to the continued support to the member states, including Ukraine. And maybe uh, last uh, quick snapshot on uh, Ukraine, uh, because we have provided uh, tailored support to member states and partner countries linked to the war in Ukraine, because mainly children, women and children were uh, refugees in the EU and potential victims of sexual or uh, THB labor exploitation. We are monitoring the situation. We are facilitating the information exchange and uh, produce regular threat assessment. Through impact, uh, also Europol further organized free, what we call hackathon, which is a uh, gathering of investigators in order to spot the online uh, services linked to THB. And uh, in 22 and in 23, this led, as you see on the screen, to 600 online platforms that were checked, 40 potential victims identified, and 20 suspects identified. Uh, uh, thank you for your attention. I won't be too long because I have exceeded my time. So I will be happy to answer your question. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Lacouf, for your presentation. We will now move on to the discussion with the JPSG delegates, and I will pass the floor to Mr. Matsu to chair this debate. Thank you, co-chair. The finish is getting near. Uh, we do have some questions left uh, on this uh, scrutiny, so let's play ping pong again short. A question, short answer, only 60 seconds. Uh, please address your question to one of both uh, speakers. And the first question will be raised by a colleague, VK. We welcome the new directive on trafficking in human beings. Hungary agrees with the strengthening of the EU response to migrant smuggling and organized crime in general, bearing in mind that people smugglers are resorting to increasingly aggressive methods. Uh, Hungary is of the opinion that we have to strengthen the external border protection of the EU. In parallel to that, we have to uh, address uh, emerging threats. We follow with attention the developments and emerging threats. Depending on needs on the ground, we co cooperate and uh, coordinate with Europol. My question is the following. How does the European Commission and Europol try to uh, fight against the new forms of human trafficking, like forced marriage, Ill 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 illegal? Uh, uh, adoption and uh, uh, sur surrogacy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, for us, as I said, uh, forced marriages, illegal adoption, and surrogacy are now added to the forms of exploitation which are in the directive. And we are speaking about, uh, of course, exploitation in the sense of trafficking in human beings. So, which means also that uh, there should be a clear criminalization in member states. 
but this is not enough. Uh, it's, it's very important, as, a, as I said also before, that if there are cases, they're also investigated. Um, and uh, there are difficulties in, 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 in this context because uh, victims do not always cooperate with the authorities. Um, so it's important, important to provide uh, protection to the victims and also support in order that they work very closely with the different authorities. In relation to forced marriages, illegal adoption, and also yeah. surrogacy, I think there should be more awareness raising in general in the member states. Okay. Uh, these are uh, um, forms of trafficking which are not so well known. It's important to raise awareness that this is something which exists also in the European Union, and that people are aware that uh, they can have sanctions if they engage in it, and also that uh, possible potential victims are aware that they can fall into the hands of traffickers. Now just from Europol's side, we welcome, in fact, the new um, anti-trafficking directive. I think it's a, it's a good step forward because uh, especially the forced marriage and illegal adoption is part of it. The online dimension has been uh, really reinforced. It's something that we really welcome. And there's a formal national referral mechanism uh, I think what is very important also for us, uh, it's also that we have a EU-wide uh, data collection of information. And um, maybe a last point on the, because I don't want to be too long, on the, on the investigators, I think the link with organized crime has always to be checked. It's not, not always the case, but it's often the case. Cross-border link, cross-border um, aspect of this, and uh, linked to organized crime. Mr. Demetriou, next question. Yes, thank you. Dear colleagues, as parliamentarians, we must get straight down tackling this phenomenon and should leave no stone unturned in bringing more criminals to justice and saving more potential victims, especially children, from these crimes. A comprehensive approach is what we need. Only through working closely with all the relevant stakeholders will we find the right tools that will strengthen our capacity to prevent and combat trafficking to human beings and to better protect its victims. At this point, we welcome the political agreement reached recently between the Council and the Parliament, the Parliament on the new anti-trafficking directive, which will strengthen our effort in this direction, and at the same time, call for its immediate adoption. In this framework, we recognize the important role of NGOs in its implementation through awareness raising, research, training, and the detection of victims of trafficking. Lastly, we wish to underline that human trafficking is mostly linked to illegal migration. In this context, we condemn once more Turkey's instrumentalization of illegal migrants in Cyprus that are transferred through the occupied areas in the Green Line, and we call for its termination. And I say once again that in European ground that they are coming from Turkey. Thank you very much. Thank you for your statement. Next question, uh, Pagazar Tundua. Merci, President. La semaine dernière, le rapport sur la directive. Thank you, uh, Chair. Last week, uh, uh, the report regarding the anti uh, um, THB uh, directive has been adopted uh, by uh, the Women's uh, Commission, and the impact for 2225 uh, was uh, including this 41% uh, of the. Uh, um, sexual exploitation victims uh, uh, manage uh, uh, to escape uh, uh, of their own devices and then uh, uh, contact uh, the police uh, forces uh, afterwards. Uh, could you tell us statistics regarding uh, uh, victims of uh, sexual exploitation for me to, to get me uh, uh, the, full, the full picture? But I'm not sure because I'm not sure you gave us uh, all uh, the figures regarding uh, this particular phenomenon. As I was saying earlier, sexual exploitation is on the increase, increased by 5.3% in 2023 against 2021. 
um, forced labour is also on the screen. It's an important phenomenon as well. You're right in saying that victims uh, uh, seldom turn uh, to uh, the law enforcement uh, forces or the police forces or other authorities that could help them out. Uh, which uh, means uh, that civil society organization can play a pivotal role. Uh, victims uh, turn more readily and more trustfully uh, towards uh, NGOs uh, uh, as compared to uh, police forces. Uh, NGOs have developed uh, an expertise in uh, helping out victims of uh, uh, human trafficking. They uh, run uh, shelters where victims uh, feel protected. And when they feel protected, uh, victims will more readily cooperate with authorities, which will help us uh, collect more evidence to sue traffickers. Thank you very much. Next question uh, by Mrs. Kardmani. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. The Commission has just tabled a new draft to directive with the aim of strengthening the fight against uh, human trafficking, uh, organ trafficking, sham marriages, uh, forced adoption, fight against illegal uh, migration. This is on, on the radar. Um, I think that this will have an impact on our uh, 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 civil codes and uh, criminal codes. What is the coordination that will help us uh, uh, follow suit with the initiative, legislative uh, initiative that will have uh, to be uh, taken? Uh, what will be uh, the measures that will be engaged? Uh, how will we uh, how will we MP be uh, kept uh, abreast on? And how about uh, uh, the uh, uh, progress made by uh, Europol in the light of the objectives set by uh, the EU body? How about uh, the shared visibility of uh, the measures uh, to be taken uh, by uh, this expert agency that is Europol and uh, the uh, EU? and the national parliaments uh, because we're all gathered uh, uh, to uh, scrutinize uh, the agencies, but we're all uh, uh, committed uh, towards implementing uh, those uh, anti-crime uh, uh, legislation. I'd like to know whether you poor and uh, national uh, parliaments on this cross-cutting uh, topic, such as uh, uh, trafficking in human rights, could be uh, anticipating the action of uh, national parliaments and uh, ensure a better coordination association in the implementation of this text by the agency. I would like to uh, answer uh, those who are in favor of the new directive. So there is, there are two years left to transpose it. We we'll, shall certainly uh, follow this process closely. I myself are at the helm of a uh, network of national uh, rapporteurs. It is within this uh, network that we discuss uh, the uh, application of this directive and all differences that can arise between member states. And you will continue. The new directive, it's important, foresees that when it comes to member states, that does not apply it yet, uh, to uh, create a post of national coordinators so that they can see that every person or authority responsible uh, for the fight against trafficking human beings be involved, including NGOs. We are a global uh, transversal uh, organ in this respect. If I may add something, it is a topic that the agency presents with great regularity and uh, uh, there is a proof positive of this that we are holding this debate today and I uh, want to underline what uh, Diane just said. Our cooperation with the Commission, the, our coordinators, like she is on all topics, the fact that she is here among us to coordinate answers the needs that you signal and within Europol, we have frequent exchanges with Diane. What you actually call for already exists through the post that is Diane's. We go to Finland, colleague Keto Huovinen, for 60 seconds. Thank you. Trafficking and smuggling are crimes that must be effectively uh, prevented and investigated. 
it's very important uh, to our authorities to know what kind of support they can receive from Europol. My professional background is as a prosecutor, and I have been involved in joint <coughs> investigation teams uh, focusing on this kind of crimes. Last week in Finland, we discussed uh, the regulation which uh, strengthening Europol's role in, in the fight against uh, migration smuggling and, and human trafficking. And according this uh, regulation, the head of Europol has the possibility to establish joint investigation teams to investigate these crimes. It remained uh, unclear at that time how the Europol joint investigation teams differs from or adds value to the current cooperation where joint investigation teams are also possible with, with Eurojust overseeing coordination. I would really much uh, appreciate if you could clear this one. Yes, thank you very much. Well, in fact, uh, the, the migrant smuggling regu regulation touch upon mainly the OTFs, the operational task forces not the, the JIT, the Joint Investigation Teams, is a tool that is managed by Eurojust, our sister agency, and it's regulated, so there's a legal framework, and it's mainly a judicial cooperation instrument. As OTFs, the Operational Task Forces, is for law enforcement, it's a kind of a modus operandi, mode d'action, uh, that uh, we can develop so you can have an investigation when you, are, you have uh, a JIT, but no OTFs, but you can have also an OTF without a JIT, and sometimes you have both. It depends how on the judicial side, the side of the prosecutor, and on the law enforcement side, we decide with the member states how to organize ourselves. It's always a process of discussion between the member states that are involved, and we choose the best solution to be efficient in the, um, in the investigation, in fact. Uh, we have also strongly connected the topic of operational task forces with the one of identification of high-value targets, that is to say, main criminal organization that we want to dismantle through this uh, modus operandi. I hope that this answers your question. Thank you. We proceed. We go to the European Parliament. Madame Brickman. Thank you very much. Um, you already mentioned the new regulation, so-called facilitators package. Um, my understanding is that trafficking and um, smuggling as are not always linked, um, and actually that EU trafficked persons are mainly EU citizens, Roma people. <laughs> I would like to understand what are the instruments in the facilitators package putting together smuggling and trafficking uh, that are two different phenomena. Um, I also have a question uh, to you, Ms. Smith. Uh, do you think that legal and safe pathways to the EU uh, would help preventing uh, migrant smuggling? And thirdly, in your capacity of uh, EU anti-trafficking coordinator, how do you see uh, this new regulation articulating with the recently adopted directive on trafficking in human beings, how to ensure consistency between uh, both instruments. Um, I'm here specifically referring to the governance system put in place in the directive. How will this be articulated with the work of uh, Europol and dedicated units on smuggling? Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, First, perhaps to, to recall that trafficking and migrant smuggling are not necessarily the same. Uh, trafficking in human beings is exploitation uh, of human beings uh, through different forms uh, and by different means, which can be force, manipulation, and so on. You have victims and you have traffickers. It does not necessarily include the crossing of a border. Smuggling is smugglers who facilitate the crossing of the border of people who sometimes pay and who are not victims. And then sometimes you have people who want to come to the European Union who fall into hand of smugglers who then also exploit them 
uh, or they arrive, they have debts, and they can be victims of trafficking. But as such, it's two different things. The facilitator's package uh, is only on smuggling, so there's no direct link with trafficking in human beings. Uh, obviously, if uh, you uh, reinforce uh, legal migration, um, this uh, will uh, um, reduce the risk of, 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 of smuggling and also of trafficking human beings for those who are victims already before they arrive, who are victims on their way to the European Union, or once they are here, they are exploited because they are undocumented, uh, uh, they are in a vulnerable situation. Um, so, again, when you mentioned both instruments, I think we have clearly a, a directive which is on, on, on trafficking human beings, and then we have the facilitators package which is on smuggling. And of course, uh, in the European Commission, uh, there's a close cooperation between the different teams, and this is also the case, I think, at Europol. Thank you. From Greece, Mr. Tsavdaridis, for one minute. Illegal migrant traffickers gain huge economic benefits from exploiting people and putting their lives at risk. Through the increased exchange of information, coordinated operational actions, and cooperation with third countries, we want to ensure that traffickers have no room for action. As a frontline member state, Greece has extensive and first-hand experience of what it means to be on the receiving end of enormous migratory pressure. Therefore, it is not surprising that we pay special attention to the effective prevention and management of migration flows and the protection of our borders, which are also European borders. In that respect, it should be clear that the fight against illegal migration has been the rema and remains an EU challenge that requires coordinated European solutions. The new pact of migration and asylum may not be perfect, but it is necessary. From our side, we welcome the political agreement reached between the European Parliament and the Council regarding the Commission's legislative proposals. In view of the new European migration policy, I would like to ask the following questions. How will Europol's role be strengthened, especially at the external borders of the EU, of the EU as well as, as its cooperation with Frontex? How will Europol's operational cooperation with partner countries be strengthened, having as an ultimate goal an effective response to cases of human trafficking? Mr. Lecouf, je pense, one minute, please. Yes. Well, <clears throat> thank you for your question. Um, um, well, the cooperation with Frontex is certainly key. Um, if we want to fight against migrant smuggling and smugglers, we need also to have the possibility to uh, deploy our action and to have uh, some intelligence about what is happening beyond the external border of the EU. I mean, uh, if they are, uh, when they are in Greece, it's rather too late for us to investigate. We can investigate on secondary movements. And it's where we have a problem, because uh, it's very difficult to cooperate with the countries, the third countries that are beyond the external border of the EU, to get information on the smugglers, on the smuggling networks, and to be able to um, uh, convince them to cooperate with us to fight these uh, smuggling networks. So it's something that we try to um, improve, and it's through the proposal of the Commission that I think that um, linked to the exchange of information that we can maybe improve on that. And we have also to align all our, um, let's say, uh, actions at the EU level and at national level towards these countries to raise to them that these questions of uh, smuggling, smugglers, is an important question for the EU and that some of the help that we provide can be conditioned to a good cooperation on the, uh, this level. But it's not only for Europol. This is a more broader policy that we have to have at the EU level. Thank you.
Thank you. We go to Italy for 60 seconds, colleague Nicoletta Spergatti. Grazie. Thank you. Migrants, migration flows are insidious as they um, promote human trafficking. For human smugglers, this is quite profitable as they are usually not captured. Moreover, the impossibility to offer a decent life to all those that enter the first entry country create further problems. There are cascading consequences on our societies, especially in our uh, away from the city centers where it's difficult and people lose faith in national and European institutions. The Italian government intervened immediately to combat uh, illegal migration. At the same time, it launched an ambitious cooperation project with African countries. This is called Mattei Plan. In this country, we will foster the economic and social development, and this will allow us to stem migratory influx on the Mediterranean. 6 November last year, as part of the relationships with our third countries, the Italian government signed a protocol to strengthen the cooperation on migration. The law will be ratified and has been ratified last week in the Italian Parliament. The Italian government cannot act alone or in isolation, as this is a very complex phenomenon and it cannot be tackled by, sing by countries of first arrivals alone. It is therefore urgent to act at a European level using synergies with Europol, Eurojust and Frontex, each with their own competence. Question, how do you think that the new European regulation may contribute at an, on an operational level to law enforcement activities against human trafficking? Thank you. Well, it's difficult for uh, Europol to comment on a proposal by the Commission, especially when the proposal uh, is on, under this discussion and we don't know how it will end. Uh, but for sure, uh, what we see as an opportunity is that, uh, again, when I was saying what I was saying before about the sharing of information, of timely information by all the countries, in order that to find the, li the links. Uh, it's the basic of Europol uh, job and the support that we can provide in this, uh, in this framework. So what we uh, would welcome is uh, a regulation, a new regulation that gives us more possibilities to us and to the member states to exchange information in a timely manner, to align also our, our um, let's say, um, a discussion with um, uh, third countries in order to be more efficient in that. But I cannot go further on this because uh, it's uh, not the job of Europol to uh, make the law, it's the job of the co-legislator. So we are waiting and we will see how this proposal will end. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Then from Poland, 60 seconds, Mr. Jaroslaw Walesa. Thank you very much. Uh, Madam Schmidt, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, forced uh, criminality? Uh, what kind of cases are we talking about here? What kind of crimes are more, most uh, prevalent? Uh, and are these cases contained within uh, one region, one member state, or are they multi-state uh, issues? Uh, uh, also, uh, Madam Commissioner uh, mentioned something about the targeted amendment for the regulation. Maybe I, I misheard uh, this, or maybe you can tell us a little bit more about this targeted amendment. Thank you. Um, on the first point, um, perhaps only um, some data from 2022, which shows that this is not limited to one region or one country. Uh, according to the information we received from, from member states, there have been 158 victims. Uh, and this is in, in almost all the countries there have been victims. So this is not restricted to one country, but we have to be aware that, uh, that probably not all the victims have been detected. And we have also to be aware that it's very difficult to have evidence in relation to false criminality. Uh, this can be uh, petty, uh, petty crime, this can be in the context of uh, drugs trafficking, 
Uh, this can be uh, people use as mule. This can be uh, fraud. Uh, so there are there are different uh, different forms. Uh, as regards uh, the regulation, I don't uh, know if you refer to the Europol regulation or to the amendment to the anti-trafficking directive. Uh, the amendment of the anti-trafficking directive, I think we gave already some some elements of these amendments, including the criminalization of the users. And also it will re reinforce data collection, which would allow to have even better data in future uh, on, in relation to trafficking human beings. Maybe if I can add one, one thing, well, what we see very often as a force criminality is the participation in, uh, in uh, robberies, in, um, in uh, house uh, robberies and so on, where youngsters are, are used often by criminal networks because they escape some uh, judicial uh, measures, especially uh, they are specific uh, let's say measure when you uh, when you arrest a minor and these legal uh, are used by uh, the criminals uh, to force these minors to uh, commit these kind of crimes but it can be on uh, all domain but we have seen that a lot in uh, robberies thank you four speakers to go before we conclude we go to Romania uh, colleague Badio. Mr. Deputy Executive Director Le Couf, dear colleagues, we know that Romania unfortunately remains predominantly a country of origin of victims of trafficking in human beings. Regarding this issue, I would like to ask Mr. Le Couf to indicate the operational support that Europol is providing to the member states affected by this phenomenon, especially for the countries of origin, as the case of Romania. Thanks. Yes, thank you very much. I, I, I must say that, uh, well, Romania is a key contributor in the THB. And maybe it's why we see so many uh, 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 of your uh, fellow country uh, men or women that are involved in THB. It's because Romania has developed a lot of uh, investigation with uh, different EU member states. So uh, the cooperation is at a very high level. And it's why, as I was saying previously, uh, we can uh, we, we can only describe what we see and we describe the cases that we are supported. And we are supported a lot of cases with Romania because the law enforcement agencies in Romania, especially Romanian police, is very uh, cooperative with all the countries that reach to them about this question of THB. So this has to be seen as a good sign of cooperation. And I would like uh, through you to thank you, uh, all our Romanian, thank you and all our Romanian colleagues for this good cooperation. Thank you. And I would like to, to add my thanks also because uh, it's not only in the context of law enforcement, but also the, in general cooperation with Romania is very, very good. So nice compliments for Romania. Congratulations. Uh, we go to uh, Slovenia, uh, Mr. Gregoric, 60 seconds. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> I, I have a question to Mrs. Schmidt and Mr. Lakouf. We were mainly speaking in this session about combating trafficking in human, human beings. Uh, it was mentioned that, in, that there is increase of human organ trafficking. And my, uh, in the last, in the several years, maybe in the last five years, we have seen several reports on human trafficking. Uh, one is from Congressional Research Service of, 2000, of 2021. Then there is a UNODC from 2015, 2020. There are also reports from WHO. There, are all, there is also a report from Interpol. My, I have two questions here. Why we have no report so far from Europol? And second, are we... Uh, are, are, is Europol cooperating with UNODC, UN Office of Drugs and Crime in Vienna? Is, uh, are you cooperating with WHO? 
and are you cooperating in Interpol? And having in mind that like in, uh, like in any corruption, you need to have donor and you need to have recipient. And in this criminal organization is on the donor side and on the recipient side. And uh, I think it's, there, there is plenty of room to tackle these issues. Thank you. Well, maybe I start on this. Uh, well, first, UNODC, as you know, is as a, a global footprint. Huh? It's a global organization. So they are speaking about cases and uh, all their reports about what they have seen. Again, uh, in Europe, we haven't seen a lot of these cases. I think that also on the, you were speaking about the donors and the, the receivers. I think that our uh, health system uh, globally in Europe is quite uh, well managed in order that I think it's difficult to uh, have uh, this trafficking of organs in uh, systems where, that are very closely monitored, where um, um, uh, the system that we have in the EU. What I can say from uh, Europol side is that we don't have a lot of these cases. We work for sure with Interpol and with UNODC on a strategic uh, level, but for us, if we don't see cases and if it's not reported by our member states, we dedicate our activities to other areas where our member states need our support. We have uh, limited resources and we need to be involved on something that is useful for our member states. Okay. Ms. Domenica Spinelli, Italy. Grazie. Thank you. I'd like to thank all of the Europol uh, staff members for everything that they've done. What uh, the Diane Schmidt and Jean-Philippe Lecoup said about the initiatives that have been um, conducted on fighting human trafficking was very interesting. I think that the Europol activity is especially important and especially its cooperation with third countries to uh, contrast criminal activities, for instance, terrorism, drug trafficking, cyber and environmental crimes, but more specifically, illegal migration and trafficking human beings. I am therefore in favor of the cooperation agreement between Europol and Frontex, which was signed recently. I think that these are a commitment that the EU is taking on finding a more efficient migratory policy. Recently, the EU finally reached an agreement on the new pact on migration and asylum, also thanks to the great work done by the Italian government. Prime Minister Giorgia Meloni acted to protect the interests of first entry countries, such as Italy. These bear the brunt of the of migratory influxes. At the same time, it acted with great pragmatism. Our government is committed to trying and find a structural solution and a definitive solution to migratory problems. The 29th of January, we had the, ver the first Italy-Africa uh, summit in the Senate in Rome. It was the very first international meeting since the Italy took over the G7 presidency to, wit to showcase the interest that um, partner partnering with uh, African countries has for Italy. Many heads of states and ministers of African nations were present and representatives of the European Union. The, I do not have questions, but this is a very important step in the right direction. Italy is there for you. So you used the minute. Bien. Nous allons utiliser la minute de, de réponse, non pas pour une question, mais pour une, un commentaire. La dernière à prendre la parole sera Madame Saxia Brickmont. Uh, sur mes questions. Yes, let, let me come back to my questions regarding the next Troika. Will we have some question time with uh, the European Commission uh, as uh, several uh, answers expected from the Commission? But let me come back uh, to my question. I 
did ask what you think of uh, establishing uh, safe and legal channels for uh, uh, migration would be an efficient way uh, to tackle trafficking in human beings. And uh, the second question was about the link between uh, uh, THB and uh, uh, migrant trafficking. We can both include it in this uh, package facilitates a package of reinforcing co police cooperation in the field of prevention, detection, investigation uh, regarding migrant trafficking and trafficking in human beings. I think that in this respect, it's important to, uh, to reconcile uh, the uh, regulations and the directives that pertain to the same issues. Uh, uh, especially if we add uh, categories that are linked to uh, THB and that uh, this has to be taken on board as well. What do you reckon? Thank you very much for popping the question. I need to apologize uh, to me. The facilitators the package was the former package linked to uh, smuggling, migrant smuggling, but you are referring to the new regulation, the new uh, proposal aiming at uh, enhancing cooperation, which is already uh, something real with Europol, but something that needs to be enhanced. And that's what we're busy doing when it comes to smuggling and uh, THB as well. But uh, uh, more must be made uh, to um, remedy those two phenomena. I think it's extremely important. Uh, regarding the first point you've made, uh, I might have been unclear in my presentation, because without saying that if uh, we are opening up legal channels uh, for those who want uh, uh, to come to the EU, this will consequently uh, uh, mitigate the risks of uh, uh, migrant smuggling and also the risk of uh, a THB, uh, because uh, there is a sharp increase that we can see of the number of victims uh, from non-EU countries. If people are not forced to board ships or trust uh, smugglers, if they are allowed uh, to travel to Europe through legal channels, the risks uh, might be curtailed. Speakers list, thank you all. Mr. Enger, your conclusion. Yes, thank you. I'll just thank Ms. Schmidt and Mr. Lecouf. Thank you very much for your presentations, for joining us today. This has definitely been an interesting um, session. And it, this concludes our second scrutiny session and our JPSG meeting. But I will now floor, pass the floor to my co-chair, Ms. Hrothehede, for her closing remarks. Thank you, Mr. Enger. And that leaves me the most pleasant uh, task of the day being to thank you, dear co-chairs, dear members of the Troika, dear members of the JPSG, dear ladies and gentlemen, dear guests. This concludes our agenda for the 14th GPSG meeting. Thank you for joining us in Ghent. Thank you for your contributions, for the highly interesting, we may say, discussions that have taken place. I would also like to thank uh, everyone involved in organizing this conference. I think uh, that like uh, every simple politician in this room, um, we build our work upon the outstanding services um, with which we in Belgium are blessed to have services with uh, extensive international experience. And we're very happy and lucky to do so, I may say, uh, probably in the name of everybody in the room. Um, and in particular, I would also like to thank my co-chairs and the European Parliament's team. Mr. Engerer, for your closing remarks now. Thank you very much, Ms. Hrothehede. Thank you for welcoming us in one of the beautiful cities in Belgium, Ghent, uh, which has been, well, this country has been my home for the past 14 years, coming and going, so it has many beautiful cities, as we can see today. And thank you for hosting us for this JPSG under the Belgian presidency. It has been a fruitful meeting. We have exciting months ahead, months ahead of us with the elections to the European Parliament taking place in all European member states between the 6th and 9th of June. We all agree that we will continue paying close attention to Europol's activities and the evolving crime threat in the European Union. Please allow me to thank in particular my two co-chairs and the Belgian Parliament's organization team for your close cooperation with the services of the European Parliament. And I now pass on the floor to our other co-chair, Mr. Metsu, for your concluding remarks. It has been a pleasure. Thank you. 
Obviously, I also uh, congratulate my co-chairs, all the delegates, all the speakers. I really believe this was uh, more than fruitful. It was a very interactive uh, day. The final thing we have to do is to stipulate uh, a date for the next GPSG, the 15th JPSG, actually. Uh, but our Polish uh, colleagues yesterday told us uh, that the fixed dates of November 11 and 12 might be a bit difficult. Why? Because, uh, of course, November 11 is a, an international remembrance day uh, where we all might have our national duties uh, at our home place. Uh, so this date might be changed. Uh, write it in pencil already in your agenda. So the next time we see each other again will be probably November 11 or 12. I wish you all a pleasant and safe trip back and thank you so much for your participation.